Um, what in a koto welcome to the June Strategy and Policy Committee for 2022. And it's a bit of a big one today, but before we kick off, I'm going to ask Councillor Tikkunia to open us with a powerful karakia, please. All powerful. Yep. Thank you, um, <laughs> Chair Smith. Um, okay, I'll do something random this morning. This is uh, affirmation, which is about intergenerational decision making, which is probably fitting because we're looking at another trip thing today. Okay. <laughs> in the strategy and policy space, but I think it's really important to recognise that um, what we've done is we've set a really fantastic foundation. We came into it uh, at a, in a negative space into this term. Uh, we had a lot of catch up to do, and thanks to the amazing Mucky on Darren and his team, uh, we have almost got there. We're so close to getting all of our bylaws back in place, uh, which is fantastic. <clears throat> um, I just wanted to take an opportunity to remind the committee that we'll be switching it up in the way I run the meeting today. We're going to give it another nudge at taking question and answer time. Uh, and once we've finished with questions and answers, and I do ask that you keep your questions direct and answers direct and to the point as well, we'll be shutting off Q&A time and moving into the debate. And I'm just really hopeful that that will steer us in a, a better direction. Um, I'm really intent on letting that question and answer time flow for as long as we need, especially on some of the items we've got today. But I do ask again that you keep your questions direct and to the point, um, and that once we move to debate time, that time is for debate only. Uh, we've got one deputation this morning from Nick Brunston from Infometrics, who has driven to the far north uh, overnight to be with us today here in person. Uh, he'll be speaking to us for about 15 minutes, and my plan is to allow around about five minutes for question and answers. He is speaking to item 6.1. Thank you. Uh, population projections. Uh, so we'll be debating that item later today. Um, we also had a required time slot today for oral submissions to the Easter trading policy. We didn't actually get any for those, however, we have received a good number of written submissions and we'll be considering the outcome of those at a future committee meeting, hopefully this side of the election. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to make a couple of acknowledgements. Firstly, that we are in Matariki and 2022 is the first year that we'll be acknowledging Matariki as a public holiday, which is a really big deal uh, and I'm quite excited about that. And also acknowledge that is not in the room, but Darren, nothing but neat going through to the finalist podium for the LGNZ Excellence Awards again. Uh, so those will be in July at the LGNZ conference, which is very exciting. That brings me to the end of my opening remarks. So we're just going to move into apologies and declarations of interest before we take Nick. So I have an apology uh, from Councillor Collard, and I've also received the uh, Deputy Mayor Court will be leaving at around about 11 this morning uh, to attend some professional development. Do I have any further apologies? Apologies, Councillor Foy will be running about 10 minutes late. 
Would somebody like to move those apologies, please? I'll move. Thank you, Mika. Seconder? I second, Madam Chair. Can the minutes record the, the apologies when they're on other council business? We know Councillor Collard is attending civil defence today. Great, thank you. Oh, that's been moved and seconded. All in favour? Aye. Those against? No, carried. And just a final call for any declarations of interest? No? Thank you, sir. Thank you, Nikata, for letting us know. Uh, Nick, that brings us to you. Lovely. The floor is yours. Welcome. No my hi my to the Far North District Council. Uh, you've got about 15 minutes, so as when you're ready. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Um, thanks for having me here today. And, um, it's been a wonderful journey over the past few months, learning uh, learning a lot about um, about the district. Um, we'll jump onto the next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to keep things running pretty quick because we've got quite a bit. Of, it's been a fairly um, a lot of detail on what we produce these projections for the council, and so I want to roll through as much of that as possible. Um, we've produced projections looking at 50 years for, um, across population, employment, households and dwellings. Um, and this includes sort of right at the district level, right down to the, the, sm the small settlement level. So there is a, there's a lot of content I won't touch on it all today, but it's all in, uh, it's all in the report, which will be um, hopefully already got more presented later. And it'll also come out in the form of a um, population prediction tool, an online dashboard that, um, that yourselves, um, that the public will be able to look at to understand what projections mean for their current um, district. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I just want to, I don't want to um, go drive into too much detail on the methodology, but I want to explain broadly how we've come, um, what we've done and how we've come, up, come about um, the figures that we have. Um, in, in short, we sort of, uh, when it comes to producing population, we look at the envelope for New Zealand. So we, we look at the um, overall outlook for net migration to New Zealand, expecting around about 30,000 net migration over the, um, per year over the next 50 years, which is sort of half of the peak that we had in the previous decade, and above what we had um, in the 2000s. That sets the envelope for New Zealand. Then we look at um, regional economy, we've got forecast um, employment in, in the far north, and then we compare what um, the employment uh, that we're expecting to what the population um, is already, and um, and new Zealand drive migration. So what that means is areas that have stronger um, employment growth or expected employment growth um, get stronger net migration to meet that employment. That's the underlying philosophy. And then we also follow, um, I guess, the conventional um, demographic process where we break the population into age groups and we look at what happens in each age group. So, for example, what, um, if you're looking at, say, the um, woman aged 30 to 34, what's the probability of them participating in the labour market, um, having children, passing away, forming different types of households, all those things. So we break, chunk the population up and look at those, all the probabilities of different things happening in those age groups. Um, we have also produced sub-district projections, which will touch into more detail um, in terms of what's, um, how we've distributed the population around the district later. Um, so the starting point being employment. Um, I think it's, it's important to sort of acknowledge the historical context because we've kind of um, we've had fairly un 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 unexpected growth in the past decade. Um, it was looking through the 2010s, it really was quite remarkable. Um, for the far north, employment growth was 2.8% over, um, over sort of the 2014 to 2020 period, which is pretty strong. You can sort of see in that chart, um, that's a fairly steep rate of growth. We're not expecting that to continue. We expect the district will continue to grow, but at a, at a slower rate, around about 1.3% for the next decade, and then tapering out further out. Um, next slide, please. So sitting beneath that projection is um, we uh, we'll forecasted employment by industry, and so there's different drivers for each industry which sort of um, combine to create the overall employment outlook. Um, in short, over the next um, it's quite small, um, over the next um, sort of 20 to 30 years, we expect most of the employment growth in the district to be in services. So that's sort of things like public administration, professional services, healthcare, um, accommodation, food services, education. Those are expected to be the big growers. Um, there's quite a bit of change happening in the agriculture space. Um, we've got horticulture taking a much, um, not a much bigger role in the economy, particularly around Kaikaui in terms of the, um, in terms of irrigation having a role there. Um, we're also expecting to see a bit of tapering off in the term, in, in the form of sort of cattle and, and livestock and dairy farming. That reflects the inclusion um, of farming in the ETS and, the, um, and, and as well as sort of um, the NPS freshwater, all sort of combines to sort of reduce the herd count. So we're expecting a bit of shift from, from um, sort of livestock farming. Into, into forestry and into horticulture, um, which sort of leads to a little bit of a decline in employment in those areas, um, particularly into the 2030s. That has a bit of an, it plays out differently throughout the district. Um, so obviously the services growth is expected to be more concentrated in your three main centres, whereas that um, sort of decline in agriculture is more likely to hurt the um, sort of more remote areas of the district. 
We are expecting construction to ease back a little bit. Construction was the sort of growth here over the past decade. We we'll expect that's going to take about a little bit, just reflecting that um, overall growth is going to be lower in the, next de in, in the future, which means you just need slightly less um, construction activity. So getting into population, so that, um, that outlook for employment that I showed you, that drives our outlook for net migration, which is obviously the key sort of external determinant in what happens to your population. Um, again, looking back on history, um, this is, these are five-year periods. You can see um, how remarkable that net migration sort of surge was in the past decade. Um, in the 2000s, the district consistently lost, lost people through net migration. Um, in, in, the, in the 2010s, it was suddenly up at 6,000 net, net gain. So it was a huge shift, and that was driven by a combination of just more people coming into New Zealand, and we all know that sort of story. Um, but the sort of lesser, lesser told story is that the way that net migration distributed around the country changed. We saw a lot more net migration going into the regions and into provincial areas, into rural areas, and that's really turned the tables in terms of growth, um, and you, as you can sort of see there. Out into the future, we don't think we're going to have the same as the last decade. Like I said before, it was pretty remarkable. So we're expecting the level of net migration into the district to be sort of roughly halfway in between what you had last decade and what was sort of the more longer-term trend. Um, the other key feature to, to note is that um, as, the, as the population um, ages, the, sort of the um, number of births is expected to be broadly steady. Um, fertility is starting to ease slightly. Um, coming up the rear is deaths. Obviously, we've got um, an ageing population with our baby boomers moving into those um, more vulnerable age groups as we get on. And ultimately, in the 2030s, mid 2030s, we expect the number of deaths in the district to outnumber births. That creates a really big drag on the population. Um, and you really and you reach the point from the 2030s onwards where you need net migration just to stand still, um, just to hold the population steady. Next slide, please. Um, so putting it all together, this sort of shows the overall growth, the medium growth track for far north relative to north in New Zealand. And so you can sort of see that um, you're in good company, if you will. Um, the, the growth track for far north is expected to be pretty similar to New Zealand and the rest of Northland. You've shared that the highs of sort of 2% per annum growth in the in the 2010s, but you sort of together transitioning to 1% and, and lower growth in the, um, in the next decade and, and further on. Um, the key thing to note for the far north is in the median projection, we expect the population will stop growing around about as we approach 2050, 2048, and decline slightly thereafter. And that reflects that sort of weight of having a, an ageing population um, it, it, when you become that dependent on that migration to grow, there's a point where you just can't, you can't keep ticking over into positive territory. Um, that's not a unique challenge for the far north. Most districts in the country are going to experience um, that, that sort of gentle population decline as we get further out. Um, and I think it's going to be a challenge in the country how we um, adjust our, our perception of what growth is and what success is as an area um, when, when it isn't possible to grow like we have in the past. Um, next slide, please. So putting that through into the population level, you're currently at, um, in the early 70s, uh, early 70,000s uh, in terms of your population. They're expected to, um, to run over sort of 80,000 in the early 2030s and peak out at around about 82,000 um, by, by the end of the um, by the end of the decade. So you can see that um, I guess the key takeaway here is that um, most of the growth in the next 50 years is expected to happen in the first 10 years. That's a, that's a pretty key um, key takeaway, um, and the growth that you're we expect in the next in the next decade will be lesser than we've had um, in the previous decade. Um, we've also produced low and high scenarios. They're based on different combinations of you know lower lower migration differences in, in fertility and, and mortality. Um, but that sort of gives you a bit of a range of outcomes. When you get at 50 years, it's inevitably quite a wide range of outcomes there, sort of from um, sub 70,000 population in the low scenario to sort of just sustained growth in, in the high, um, almost reaching 100,000. Um, next slide. So translating this through the population, um, there's a pretty big story here in terms of the ageing population, which I'm sure you're aware of. Um, so the population aged 65 years and over has doubled in the past um, in the past two decades in the far north, and is expected to grow another 50% in the coming de um, in the coming decade. And that's really the biggest change in terms of the age structure. What we're seeing is that green group, which is the 45 to 64 year olds. There's a large number of baby boomers in that in that group, and they'll be crossing over the uh, into the into the purple group, they'll be turning 65 by 2030, um, and, and sort of growing that age group quite strongly. Um, working further down, um, you can see that the the youth population, the sort of under 20 and the 20 to 44 um, population, really just stands still, doesn't really go anywhere, um, sort of just holds its own. Um, which has, has translations through in terms of services at a net level. You wouldn't expect more schools, for example. Next slide, please. Um, so this translates through the household growth. We, um, we take those population projections and translate them through into what um, into household formation rates to estimate the number of households across the district. 
Um, you've had some really strong household growth over the past, um, just since the census, around 2% per annum for the last sort of four years. Um, this really follows the, um, pretty closely follows the trend for population. The key difference is you've got changes in average household size, which affect demand for housing. So the average household size is expected to ebb around about 2.6, 2.7 people per household across the district. Um, but as that sort of um, heads, heads down, as the population ages, um, that increases the demand for housing um, ahead of um, population growth. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this also translates to dwellings, so when, when it comes to dwellings of, um, combined, what we think will be the, the number of households, that's sort of the um, permanent, permanent residence, if you will, um, but also the number of unoccupied dwellings, that's your batches um, um, spread around the district as well. Um, and this really uh, translates to a similar sort of, um, similar sort of picture, um, peaking at, um, at 36,000, 37,000 um, in, in, the, in the late 2040s. Um, one key thing to note here is we've really, really struggled to get good data on holiday houses, on unoccupied houses, and so essentially what we've done here is assume that the number of unoccupied houses will stay the same um, into the future, that is that they won't grow just because we haven't been able to find a, 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 something concrete to peg a, a better assumption on. Um, at a district level, that probably doesn't have a huge implication. When you get into areas like Atlas Bay, that probably does have a bit more of an implication. You might expect that they would have further legs in terms of um, you know, batch and holiday home growth. Excellent. So um, moving on to sub-district population, so we've produced um, population at district level, we've also broken it down into um, areas of interest, and this is where it gets much more interesting, I guess, for the infrastructure planners and the like. Um, we've produced it at different levels, so we've used SA2s, which are sort of um, cells, if you like, um, the, the, the stats and it divides the district up into 47 cells. Um, we've produced for those, so those are sort of scales like Kerry Kerry Central, Kerry Kerry South and the like. I've also produced projections for, um, for small settlements, there's sort of an interest in that, so areas like Mitty Mitty, we have a, a population estimate and a projection for them. Um, and we've also produced projections for the wastewater service area, which obviously the key implication for um, how you develop those plants and those schemes. Um, when it's come to, to projecting at a district-wide district, district -wide level, um, what we've seen before is, is fairly numbers heavy. Um, there's a lot of good data at a district level. When we start getting down to these small areas, the numbers start to sort of disappear and we're running a little bit light on the ground. And so we've used a lot more qualitative information that's much more grounded in, in um, work, um, you know, discussions with council officers and the like, uh, and pulling in a variety of sources. So we've considered the population that is in each area already. We know that, we know how old they are and the like. Um, we've got data on non developments, so things that are going through the resource consent project, that gives us a pretty good indication there's going to be some population there at some point. Um, we've also looked at work by the council um, looking at latent capacity, so looking at how many empty sections out there are around and what the potential to subdivide the sections um, that are already there is within the Oxford district plan. We've also looked at wastewater and, and water capacity, which generally wasn't a particularly binding um, constraint. And also considered likelihood, which is a bit of a catch-all, where this reflects that um, jumping back to that employment um, forecast, we're expecting stronger employment growth in the in the services area, which gain, uh, benefits the um, three main centres more so than the rural areas, and therefore we sort of nudge things, the population growth more towards those um, those three main centres. I've also um, looked at, I guess, what's happened in the past and, and, and drawn a heavy influence of what growth has happened in the past decade. Okay, that gives us some reasonable indication of of where we think things are going to happen going forward. And we've also tried to consider um, where we can um, climate change. There wasn't anything sort of concrete to, um, to to hang this on, but we just sort of used that to sort of nudge things um, a little bit away from some of the more vulnerable areas of the district. And we also took, finally took a bit of consideration into, um, I guess, the um, changing conditions around public kind of housing. Um, there's a number of initiatives that have come through that make it a bit easier than it has been in the past, and so we've sort of um, considered that by adding a little bit more weight into population happening in more rural areas um, than we would otherwise, reflecting that there's, there's been a bit of a shift and we've expected it's, it's, it's easier to do that, and therefore it's more likely to happen um, going forward. Uh, next slide, please. So for the purposes of today, I'm going to jump... Um, chop the district up into eight pieces. I wasn't going to be able to talk about 47 pieces in, in, in 15 minutes, um, so I've chopped it up into eight pieces, but uh, in the report and in the online tool, there is the full data beneath this. But this is sort of just to, um, to be able to draw out some of those high-level um, high level points. So um, you can sort of see that in the map, that sort of um, each main centre in the, in the area surrounds the Hokianga, Kaitai and surrounds Dallas Bay, um, Kaio, Whangaroa, Kirikiri, Waikapa, um, Kaikoua and surrounds Kawakawa and surrounds and that sort of Paihe, the Bay of Islands. Area. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this shows the projected population growth for those eight areas. Um, first, firstly, in terms of the orange and the dark blue, it shows the, um, what's happened over the 
the, the 2000s and the 2010s, and I think that sets the scene quite well. Um, it's interesting to note in the, in the 2000s when population growth was lower across the district, there was pretty nil population growth anywhere but Kitty Kitty Waikato. And then as it, as it moved into the 2010s, one of the key stories is that growth did start to spread around the district much more than it had in the past. So you see that um, Dallas Bay, Kaikoui, um, Kaitai were starting to take quite a decent share of growth, although Kiri Kiri continued to lead. Moving forward uh, into the next decade, which is the Green Bar, um, we're expecting again Kitty Kitty to take the, take the lion's share, sort of sitting at around 40 to 50% of district growth happening in the area. Um, and then sort of lesser, lesser shares going to the, uh, the other two main seaters, going to, Kau, um, going to Kaitaia and Kaikoui rather, um, as, and to a lesser extent, Dallas Bay. As we get further out, we expect the growth is going to be more concentrated in Kiriki Waikapa as that services employment growth drives population growth. And as we get further and further out, sort of when we're getting into the 2040s, we expect that there's going to be pretty minimal population growth um, throughout the rest of the district and starting to get into some sort of gentle population declines um, in some of the further flung areas. Um, again, that's sort of, um, it's something we probably don't really have a frame of reference of at the moment, um, but I think that's sort of, it's going to be pretty common across the country for um, to be experiencing slight population decline, and that's something that we'll um, just have to get. Um, have to get used to and familiar with and, and, and grapple with as a, as a country. Um, next slide. Please. Um, so that's that's my presentation. So happy to take any questions. I can't be around for when the report is tabled later on. So um, now is the chance. Um, Kia ora, Nick. Thank you for that. I've got Mia Carter and then Councillor Tikinia, Councillor Research, Councillor Clinton. Nick, thanks for the presentation. And you talk about uh, population growth being in the service sector and also ageing population. Uh, just so everybody knows, obviously, I'm not going to age anymore, so I'm not going to talk about that. Just take a note of this. But um, what concerns me is that service, services and ageing population cost. You haven't talked about the productive sector and how we're going to fund it. And one of the challenges we have as a nation is we've be aware of the debate around infrastructure. We've underfunded our infrastructure by as much as $180 billion over the last six years, and now we've got to catch up. And I'm surprised that you haven't mentioned how it is that we're going to afford the increase in cost of service delivery and an ageing population without addressing the productive area. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. I mean, ultimately, we've, um, it's, it's, I guess, to an extent, it's a continuation of the status quo into the future, and it's um, because ultimately it's not as, um, there, yeah, there is that infrastructure deficit, and it is an action, and at this point, it's not to see how that gets resolved. Yeah, but, but you're also talking about growth in, in servicing the bureaucrat, bureaucrats and the ageing population. How's that funded? Oh, well, that's, that, that is a big question. I mean, I guess you take some sort of super thing. Um, an example of that, we, we're continuing to pay out super, but we don't know how we're going to pay it. Um, excuse me, through the chair, can I just yeah. clarify something? Nick was procured to do a population projection. He wasn't procured to do an economic um, uh, enablement plan or a strategic plan. So his job is pretty, pretty narrow and we put on the boot. So he's provided us with a facts and a basis for um, fitting up things like the district plan. And the spatial planning projects are going on, which we you should, that's where you should be saying um, uh, some of the things around how we're going to address these things that he's put up. So it's purely population projection. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Um, Councillor Tickney, can I just clarify <coughs> who, who was engaged to do the economic analysis for our district plan review? Uh, would you like to ask that question when we're considering the district plan? <coughs> Sorry, what? Who was engaged to do the economic analysis in terms of our district plan? Yeah, um, the economic consultancy bill. And we won't have a presentation on that? No. Thank no, you. Councillor Tiffany. Thank you, Chief. Hey, thank you for your presentation. I, um, I love facts and statistics and estimations and all this sort of stuff, but I probably didn't get to deep dive into the info report because of the district plan which is sitting in this. Um, I just had a question around, I know you mentioned Papakainga in terms of our uh, um, population estimates, but one thing when I was reading this and when you were doing the presentation that I wondered had been considered uh, what the effect that settlements will have on the population. 
Conservation Group of the District. And as an example, um, in 1995, Tainamine settled with uh, the Crown for $170 million and they've turned that into like almost $2 billion in, in assets now. Um, so looking within, you know, Ngāpuhi is going to have the biggest settlement that this country will ever see, worth anywhere up to, you know, like half a billion dollars in, in settlement money. Um, the seat of Ngāp the heart of Ngāpuhi, the Arunanga, is based here in Kaikohe, here in the whānau. So I wonder if that is taken into consideration, the fact that we have, like, our Muri, Muri Whenua Confederation of Tribes up north have recently settled. And the growth that will come with the unlocking of kind of developments, the um, allowance for development on Whenua Māori, because we have very Whenua Māori work here, and the latest um, what is it called? National policy statement for Indigenous biodiversity is going to allow development to still happen there. Can we assume that? Have you taken that sort of stuff into consideration? Not explicitly. I mean, I think the challenge with that is that um, obviously the, 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 the pot of money, we don't, you know, and that's likely that we spend in the area, but we don't know sort of for certain exactly where it's going to be spent. You know, for example, um, some of those elements have been invested just commercially, you know, purely commercial basis outside of, I guess, outside of their road. Um, it has factored in a little bit in terms of high quality. I mean, Kaikou has actually had some strong growth in the last decade, but you know, it, it, under, under, under line of view that there was more growth to come because that, and that was part of it, not all of it. Thank you, Nick. I, I actually enjoyed your presentation. I think it's pretty accurate when you're looking at Northland as a whole as well as you yourself. And I know it's crystal ball grazing, so I'll let you off. But when you, when you look down at the smaller scale, that's where I probably think there's a bit of a more consideration given. Um, and it's around, as you probably aware, worldwide there is actually called a catastrophic uh, de you know, um, decline in, in population worldwide. And every country in the world has, has a significant drop in fertility rate. And New Zealand is no different, although I must say that amongst the Maori population is, is where it's the highest. So that's where I think there's probably some, and you're looking at your migration, but then you've got um, Western Australia, for example, and I think you'll see more of this, and they, they actually um, um, advertising on here in New Zealand to try and get people to move to Western Australia. So I, I'd expect to see this intensifying far more, you know, increase to, you know, have far more pressure to get New Zealanders and people with experience, especially young people, out of the country. So. Um, I think you've included that in your way you've done things, but um, and you look at the 6,000 deaths. You know, so, so where I think there's probably things not going to quite line up is actually in Karakuri, where you have a very high and ageing population, and the, your deaths will, you know, certainly outstrip births. Um, so the population increase there would be through net migration, and then you've got to say, well, where's the where's that work going to be? And that's what that's the issue. So Mukul's touched on it when you have half a billion dollars being spent here at Innovation Enterprise Park and also the desire, you know, there's the, the pressure on the country and the world for food uh, and energy and both food and energy and the land is, is around here. So that's where I think there might be a slight different mix in that scenario. Uh, I think you're right in, in, in assuming, as you look at the picture now, looking at forestry and saying yes, there will be more pressure on forestry, but I think that's likely to change and less, less uh, agriculture. But again, that's why I think that's likely to change is um, the world will catch up with science and realise that if all of the world were to go down the line of New Zealand dairy, it'll cut dairy emissions in half. And so there is actually a very good, strong selling point that we've got through our high quality value of food. And New Zealand will be trying to pay its debts off. So I think it's got to be, you know, it, it, you see what I'm saying? So these are th things going through my mind that there is, um, you know, where's the employment going to be? What is going to be the product that the world will be wanting? And, um, you know, are we, you know, can we attract migration in here? And I'd, I'd say that um, uh, overall you've done a good job, except I think when it gets down to those different areas, it may, may surprise people what it looks like. So do you want to comment on all of that, uh, Rambler? Um, yeah. You can respond to that and say that in 2050, the Farm Off District Council will incentivise residents to have more kids. <laughs> I don't think they will. But that's a good start.
<laughs> on, on the attraction point of view, I mean, I think there's a, we're into, into um, a, bit time. There's a, a, a very interesting phase, we're kind of, I think, in terms of the labour market more generally. So we've seen the, um, I guess, the COVID-related workforce issues um, early in COVID when we sort of lost our migrant workers and then sort of kind of on workers standing down. We're kind of just going sort of um, labour shortfall after shortage, shortage after shortage, sort of short, medium, long. So we're going from the Omicron stuff, we're going to a bit of a loss of our, a little bit of a brain drain at the moment, which is more of a medium term issue, but it's causing a lot of issues right now, and then that's rolling into the, into the, um, into the aging population, into the retirement of the baby boomers. It's not necessarily going to be 65, but when they do retire, that's going to weigh heavily on the population. So we're going into quite a tight period, and that net, net migration that we've sort of given you, um, it's not it's not for granted, it's, um, it does take effort to attract them. It's, um, yep. it's going to be a pretty competitive environment for regional agencies to attract the population. Um, on, the, on the food side of things, um, I guess we're not expecting that the um, sort of the likes of dairy and stuff will go away, but again, the um, NPS and, and I guess carbon pricing suggests that we'll get a, a tapering in the heat count, and ultimately that does, um, you know, just slightly a small reduction in the sensitivity that can have a large reduction in terms of the environmental impact. And I think that's sort of where we sort of see the national legislation going, rather than completely getting rid of um, you know, dairy, for example, because of those underlying efficiencies and the past your face in the mind. That's some of the information. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Councillor Uh Just quickly, I am aware that we have gone over time, but I'm also aware that Nick won't be here to speak to the item, so I'm going to let the questions roll for a little bit longer. Sure. Yeah, thank you for this. Um, just the first comment, I think we have to consider these numbers always speculative until we get a long-term coherent immigration policy, which no government, as you well know, has managed to come up with. And I think at the minute we've just got this weird reactive sort of gap-filling policy as a sort of policy at all, but Having got that off my chest, two specific questions. Um, one is I'm a bit confused. You're suggesting that natural increase will decline and go negative in the 2050s. I thought it already was. We've got a fertility rate of about 1.7, and I understood until you get to about 2.1, then you're actually losing numbers absent migration. migration. Um, so mixed up it's sort of a time frame thing. So I guess over so the two point one is kind of a long term sustainability level, but it, um, your your deaths are kind of um, they're coming. <laughs> they're in the mail if you will. So it's sort of a timing issue. Thanks, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Great deal. Yeah. Well, thank you. Except for the beer, basically. Except you've got one for everyone. Yeah. The only other one, the um, under the economy, you talk about horticulture expected to grow, which it will, and you mentioned the north, mid-north water scheme, and you add a number of 132 jobs in horticulture. With the, um, the North and the Taitokarau Water Trust, their application to the Otawiri Dam, they indicate that 1,300-odd hectares that can be irrigated by that project will generate about 490 jobs in horticulture, plus 60-something, 60 69 in post-harvest. So from that one scheme alone, you're looking at well, 550 odd jobs, and yet you're talking about 130. I'm just wondering. Robots. Um, um, post harvest will be in different industries. So there's another one for patching services. Sure, yeah. Yeah, there's a. But 490, 532, yeah. and that's, ignored, that's not including the other schemes that are popping up, which is. So I mean, frankly, it does seem very low estimates. But mm -hmm. Thank you, and thank you for your presentation and, and coming here to panel. Uh, I just had a question about your assumptions to get to these population predictions. Uh, was that based on the census, or was this based on the role from doctor's offices or from school roles? Um, the reason that I ask this question is because I have seen there's been a huge increase over COVID domestically, a uh, transition from the metropolitan centres to regions because we have fibre, we have lower house prices, we have 20 beaches within 20 minutes, and, uh, and we're able to attract those professionals, particularly those looking to have children, uh, one or two children. Uh, yeah. 
Uh, and uh, I think those assumptions there, I'm not sure if they'll be correct, depending on your basis for your assumptions. Yeah, so in terms of the base, um, I guess the 2018 census is kind of like the starting point, and then we use official estimates from stats, NZ and population, which combine um, things like IRD, um, health enrolments with one piece of the puzzle, IRD, MSD, so sort of every time you track the government, they track you anonymously. Um, and so that builds up the, the picture of population, um, both for each of those sort of 47 areas of the district, um, and that's up to 2021. So it does include some of that sort of um, I guess post-COVID population rebound, if you will, into sort of where it's going in the district. And as a side note, that's sort of the, probably one of the sadder points. We're seeing very, very, very strong growth in small parts of the district, so sort of four or five percent population growth in a year, and virtually no building consent, which doesn't paint, paint a very nice picture for that. Potentially, um, how we're actually managing to house these people. Um, we're seeing a quite, quite big disparity in that population growth. But um, it is obvious that what the what we're seeing in post-COVID has been factored into an extent, um, but we haven't sort of. Um, pushed it out forever because ultimately it's a short term trend. We, we try to be a little bit conservative and taking too much notice of the short term sort of trend and, and creating a long term future based on it. So it's sort of it's a little bit of the recent history and a little bit of the long term history, if that makes sense. So if if that, that young professional um, trend continued at the same magnitude that it is, then yes, we would undercut it and you probably might end up with something close to the higher scenario. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I just asked that in the context of the other people that might engage with population specialists as part of the district plan review, particularly around the territory and work up that area, um, population predictions and um, subdivision or infill uh, land use options, um, considering we're not changing that controlled activity a lot size um, proposed under the current district plan uh, for that area. Um, through the chair, um, so the work that Nick has done um, is the is the population that we are using for the spatial planning uh, work that we're doing in the Kitty Wild area and also for the um, for the district plan. Um, Andrew can confirm that with these updated reports based on Nick's work. Great. Yeah, and, and thank you. I just wanted to point that out to the other elected members that the anomalies can be challenged if they get their own um, person who will be looking at population projections and the economy. Um, another thing about diversification of land use and therefore population changes in Tehiku, we raised about the water stand in Kaipne, uh, just about the water take consent from the aquifer, uh, namely the Motutangi um, environmental pork for 17 applications, um, and the change of land use to horticulture. Uh, I wasn't sure if that there was touched on in terms of potential changes in land use and population growth in the greater Kaitara and surrounds area. Um, was on the explicit very next to court um, side of things, but I, I, I understood that the, um, the the broader water scheme under the Tetaikokara Water Trust um, wasn't going to go ahead in the, in the far north. It was, or it wasn't, wasn't moving to the same extent as the Kaitara one. Um, the, that consent's already been approved by the Regional Council and is just in the Environment Court, so um, I'm, I'm not sure what the basis of providing the information, but in terms of the progress, the TACU consent's already been In terms of funding and building, I think the... The individual water take consent's yeah. based on 17 applications, but it's a giant geographic area. If you look behind you, it's from about uh, your waist to the top of your head. Yep. Uh, geographically, um, therefore, spatially, that's a significant opportunity for diversification of land use, transport links, and therefore population growth to provide employment. Um, I see that as a significant opportunity that probably should be touched on a bit more. Um, I'm not sure if the planners have any um, response to that. <coughs> Um, the Tintai Takara the trust that you referenced, wasn't it? Right. So the information they provided to you. That's just for the mid north thing. Yeah, that's for the mid north. Right. It's not for, not for the, the TO Cody at Kuka, which is the biggest act as far as okay. all of them. So, well, so maybe we mm -hmm. could look into that and mm -hmm. So that, that may be brought up in terms of other methods as well. And, um, it's a significant amount of water. Thank you, Councillor Foy. Do I have any questions from the side of the panel? Uh, I, oh, Councillor Stratford. The um, 
population increase for Kirikiri area and decline in the other areas? Um, in, in your analysis of data, have you stumbled on any any key group that are going to Kirikiri, that age dem demographics? Um, I mean, certainly historically, it's, it's been that sort of more biased towards the older age. It's been fairly unfortunate, and that you know, I mean, France everywhere really loses their 18 year olds that want to go and see the world, but unfortunately, you've sort of lost their 10 year olds and gained 50 year olds, which isn't great for long term population sustainability. But I think um, there is an underlying assumption that I guess that um, most development in, in, in the Kiwi would change and evolve, and so I think it's probably more expecting a more balanced population coming in, um, which I guess reflects that. that um, the projections are employment driven, and so to achieve that services growth, you do need to get um, more um, economically active um, migrants to achieve that. And do you think that any um, health or uh, other government policy influences the length of time that you expect people to stay in their own home rather than go yeah. join the silver tsunami? Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess it would. Um, in terms of what we've seen, um, there didn't. Because some you get different dynamics in different areas. Some areas you get sort of an inflow at 50 and then an outflow at 80, because you need to get the advanced services. It doesn't seem to be the same thing going on in Kirikiri Wipe Up, which is just people are able to, you know, get what they need right to the end um, in that area, despite not having, you know, a hospital yeah. per se. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Street. So Nick, I just had a, a couple of questions, and I think building on Councillor Foy's first question. Um, a gap that I've seen in the report and then in your presentation was definitely in that digital space, and that's a strength or an opportunity that we have identified for our district, and I'm looking to build on that. And post-COVID, absolutely, we've seen that that um, Zoom culture move into the region, so I was interested to know how that was taken into account with projections. Are you able to touch on what that might look like going forward? You mentioned that that may be more of a short-term influence, but what might that look like going forward long term if, for example, a region has identified that as a growth strength? Um, I guess it, it comes through a little bit implicitly, so in terms of when we're projecting for, we're considering um, with different weighting of what we've seen in the, in, the research, in the short term history and the long term history, so it comes from that short term growth. I guess what I'm saying is that um, it would have been a key factor in your sort of 3% growth in the last couple of years, but we wouldn't necessarily, and it will continue to be a factor going forward, but we wouldn't necessarily expect you to to keep growing at that same level. Um, but ultimately, you're, you're getting um, stronger, you know, particularly the next decade, stronger growth than you got in the 2000s, so you can sort of, um, it does accommodate for um, that digital enablement. It is it is a, um, a short-term trend. I mean, it has been funny in that, you know, we've had these tools actually around for like 15 years, and it's just suddenly we're actually starting to use them and accepting people use them in the business. And so it is hard to, um, to crystal ball gaze and know how much that's fundamentally going to change or keep growing in, in the future. In general, um, I mean, it has. I know I've talked to the council. It's helped the council with you know getting staff in, uh, being able to be flexible. But um, we also see that um, <coughs> when workers are able to work fully remotely, they're not necessarily choosing to go out into the regions. They might be going into just a slightly broader diameter around the main centres. Um, I think it's still not super clear in terms of uh, where the workforce will land with um, how common full remote goes as opposed to sort of part remote. So, um, as, what, what I'm getting at is that. Um, the idea that um, you're going to have a large number of people in Auckland coming up to the far north and living completely remote from their employer, it's not, it's not certain. It might be that we, the, the sphere of influence of Auckland extends to a two-hour commute because people only have to do a two-hour commute once one day a week, um, becomes more feasible than five days a week. So um, there's a bit of an allowance in there, but we haven't kind of gone full digital because it's not super clear exactly how it will land. Thank you. And then my second question was around planning for growth, and I understand that our organisation hasn't been excellent in this space in the past, but we do have a desire to change that. So when we are looking to plan for growth, and I think this feeds into our spatial plan, is there some kind of, um, I guess, buffer percentage, like a plus or minus percentage, if a council was to say, want to take a more build it and they will come approach in a sustainable manner? Is there some kind of best practice, plus or minus, X number yeah. that assists with that. So I mean, zooming out a bit, I think a lot of councils I talk with feel a little bit burnt from the last decade. That, you know, they were plan in many cases, the more rural provincial councils are planning for a pretty muted scenario, and they end up with something quite different. And 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 ultimately, I guess the decisions around enabling growth were a factor in housing affordability and the challenge there, because they were expecting growth that didn't allow for capacity. Um, some councils choose to adopt the high scenario, so ultimately it's not a percentage that comes down to whether you use low, medium, or high. A uh, medium is kind of what the most likely thing that we expect to happen, but you might choose. Consciously choose a high, deliberately slightly over invest in your infrastructure, 
um, with, I guess, a rationale that you wanted to over, you know, slightly oversupply the market and how much sure that you're, I guess, doing your part in terms of housing affordability, perhaps. But obviously, that's a decision for you to make because it has big implications in terms of the infrastructure spend when you've got that deficit to catch up with anyway. Thank you, Nick. Uh, just quickly, Roger wanted to make a closing comment. Uh, just some, um, Nick is part of the um, Kiki Wapa Spatial team, planning team, so he's involved in a lot of our meetings, so he's also doing some additional work um, for that project as well um, on sort of the economic assessments, so maybe answering some of the questions on, on what it might look like in um, Kiki Wapa area. So um, all this work is fitting into that. Great, thanks, Roger. And I recognise that this is only one building block of the work program that we are doing, but it's a great work. Uh, building block. I have no further questions at this point, so Nick, I would have wished you the best of travels back to Auckland, mm -hmm. thanks to the lovely weather you experienced down there uh, yesterday, and I hope that you get to get out and experience some of that um, map on the wall behind you as Councillor Foyer yeah, out yeah. before you uh, get away. Fortunately, we have turned the weather on for you, so enjoy it out there and travel safe. Thank you. Yoda. All right, everybody, thank you for that. Uh, just a couple of uh, further announcements or reminders. Uh, we are streaming via YouTube live stream. Nick, apologies, I probably should have reminded you that before you started speaking. Uh, and we've also been recorded. The agenda is available online through our Info Council website. Uh, and a reminder for anybody on Teams, if you're not speaking, please keep your microphone and camera off. And if you are speaking, please turn them on. And a reminder for everybody in the room, please keep your paper rustling to a minimum. Thanks to our lovely speakers uh, above us. But that brings us into the formal part of our meeting. Uh, so item 4.1, confirmation of previous minutes. I'll move. I'll Thank you, it. Councillor Tipinia. Moved by Councillor Tipinia, seconded by Councillor Busech. Any comments, questions? No, I just had a brief uh, comment pointing out that we left item 6.1 resident opinion survey to lie on the table last meeting. It's not on our agenda today, but we will be receiving it to the next committee uh, meeting. I'm not sure if we can track that through our action sheet. Well, that would be great. Otherwise, it's been moved and seconded that the Strategy Policy Committee agrees that the minutes of the meeting held 3rd of May 2022 be confirmed as a true and correct record. Moved by Councillor Tepania, seconded by Councillor Fusich. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? No? Carried. Thank you. Oh. Mm. Item 5.1, proposed Far North District Plan public notification. So at this point we might, won't be moving a resolution, we'll be opening the floor to comments firstly from Darren and his team and then to questions before putting a resolution for debate. So, Darren, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. You've got three seconds before. Okay. Uh, simply to say that this is not the end. This is uh, this is a milestone for us today. We publicly notified, we will publicly notify, um, which allows us to move into the formal submission process. For those of you who are involved in the, the, the current operative plan, um, it's not something that occurs overnight uh, or in one shot anything. So I appreciate the work that has gone into this current draft uh, and the discussion and debate that we will have in front of us today. And again, I will remind you that this is to publicly notify to give our communities the opportunity to make submission on of the draft next I would hope Greg would have something to add. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Darren. Um, actually, can I say thank you? Um, thank you to our Penawa, our communities, our stakeholders, and to our elected members in letting us go through a very deliberative process to talk to our communities to understand what's the problems, what are the issues that we're trying to fix, um, how do we, what's the significant problems, what's the significant resource management issues. Then what are the solutions working with the communities on the policies, the objectives and policies, testing those through a roadshow and engagement process. What are, what are the, the methods testing those through a roadshow of a draft district plan? What are the solutions to some very 
um, good challenges around key issues, so the targeted engagement processes. Um, and so it has gone through a very deliberative process. And as Darren said, to get to this point, which is not a conclusion, it is the next part of a discussion to allow our communities to, to comment on, to submit on what our professional objective viewpoint is on what sustainable management of natural and physical resources looks like for our district. And our district is pretty unique. It's got lots of very special attributes and wonderful communities. And so trying to find the right solutions for our district is a really good challenge. And um, we love a challenge. And I think we've put together a really um, cohesive, integrated package of um, policies and methods. Um, so we are moving to a, a different discussion. So in the event that council were authorising um, notification, we would be looking at a number of steps before public notification to close the loop, to improve the way that people understand this opportunity, to create channels for support and submissions, so independent processes to help people submit on the, on the plan. And so there is a very um, integrated and comprehensive approach to bring people through to awareness and participation. And so that would be the next step that would flow from a, a decision to authorise today. Um, and just the final thing to say is to say thank you to the team. <laughs> um, sorry. Andrew McPhee, Theresa Burkhart, Sarah Trinder, Tammy Worcester, since 2015, have worked on this. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Highly invested and have done a great job. Liz Searle joined us recently and has done a great job in bringing her awareness. Venice Baker has supported us faithfully through the, through the making process. And um, ex external specialist Jamie Cannon has got us to the finish line. So great work and uh, thank you for your time. <laughs> yes. Any questions I'll take uh, once I get over myself, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Greg, and please do not apologise for that. There's a huge amount of investment that is in this report in front of us today, and I don't think any of us in this room underestimate it in any way, so Mia Carter is absolutely right. So before I open the floor to elected members, just a reminder that this is question and answer time only, uh, not debate time, so this is your time to have your questions and uh, clarifications addressed before we move into debate on a resolution. So the floor is open. Who wants to kick us off? Should we do chapter by chapter or? <laughs> the floor is open to questions. How you want to roll that is up to you. Nobody wants to go first? Oh, I do. Councillor Stratford. Thank you. Um, Greg, just because um, I've read so much stuff over the last couple of weeks um, and, and we've had the workshops last week and it, it may just not be something that is meant to be in writing at notification point, but the the items that are coming into effect at notification, where do they sit for the public knowledge? Certainly. Um, thank you for that question. Um, part of that of creating awareness yeah. and um, understanding about those immediate legal effect issues is what is a real focus for us. Yeah. We want to make sure that people are aware where the plan are aware of where the plan affects them. And um, as explained in the workshop last week, the yes. plan affects everybody. Yes. But we want to be, be able to ensure that there is sufficient understanding of how it affects you. Um, and those provisions that have immediate legal effect, which are quite concise, I think we estimated less than 5% of the plan. Yeah. Um, there's a number of ways. The, pub the public notice, which every ratepayer will receive, highlights those immediate legal Oh, that's provisions. right, yes. Yeah. Um, the E plan as well calls out those provisions that have immediate legal effect. So in fact, there's a there's a note and a gavel symbol saying this rule has immediate legal effect. So that's a tool, not just for our community, but also for our processing team, so they can appreciate how do they efficiently bring that in and, and take it through their, their process, where the operative district plan still has a life as yeah. well. Will have a life until we get um, through different milestones of the plan making process. 
So there is a very concerted campaign to create sufficient awareness and understanding of what a notified plan means, keeping in mind it's a very concise list of things that have immediate legal effect. Further question around that, for the um, you know landowner out there who doesn't have any understanding of um, district plan, isn't a commissioner like myself, um, just you know one a key sentence on what the weight of those items that have immediate effect, how we, you know, how you've determined that they need to have immediate effect. I know why, but for the general For sure, public. for sure. Look, um, that's a really good question because the, the legislation calls out those items that must have immediate legal yep. effect. And the, the reason for that is to, to, I guess, avert that potential that people might you know, go and, and progress land uses that are being evaluated through a plan making process and those um, <coughs> particular provisions are around matters of national importance. So historic heritage, yep. Indigenous biodiversity um, and um, soil and water. So um, the, the method that we've had is legal advice to say, well, what are the rules in the plan that fit that bill? And so it's been delineated through the electronic version yep. to show it's just these things. Um, but also um, we have a process to ensure that our processing planners um, be able to take those, those matters into account with efficiency when um, assessing resource consents. Um, now, as you go through the plan making process, there is submissions further submissions, once we've had all the submissions come in, then hearings, and then recommendations from an independent hearing panel to cancel for decisions. So not really until you get to the latter stages of that process to does the weighting become higher for the proposed plan, because you get to see what people have submitted on and what the, the to and fro is between process, between reporting planners and the, the recommendations from the um, independent panel. Council then make decisions, and then that process is subject to appeal as well. So it's quite deliberative. Thanks, Greg. Greg, I'll jump in and go next. But just a couple. Uh, first, touching on that one, we've seen obviously finally the draft uh, exposure draft for the NPS for Indigenous Biodiversity <laughs> Land. And as Councillor Tipania touched on earlier, there has been some really good improvements by the looks of things. My question is just around how that comes into effect, acknowledging that the SNA is one of the uh, chapters that comes into immediate legal effect. So how does that work, knowing that we're in a space where that higher order document is still being developed? Are we comfortable that at the moment we're going to meet what that's uh, stating? And what does the change process look like as that policy document is drafted further? Thank you. Um, another great question. Um, an exposure draft doesn't have traction in that plan making process. Um, but in the in the making of that exposure draft, we've been looking at it. In fact, we've been um, trying to um, develop our proposed plan with, with a lot of thought to that approach. The key difference is that we're responding to the regional policy statement until such time that national policy statement is gazetted. So our our short leash, if you like, is to the, the Northern Regional Council regional policy statement. So that's what our plan does. Um, Gazettal of that national policy statement gives us an opportunity to submit on the plan um, those measures, but also we have a lot the, the timeframes, for example, in the national policy statement identify that yes, you do have to map uh, significant natural areas over a five year period from the period from the moment of gazettal. Um, so there are there are other very positive elements of the exposure draft around um, cultural heritage and Taonga, identifying Taonga. So working with regional council, iwi authorities, iwi hapu to, to identify these resources and then bring them into a plan making process. So there's some very good things that we don't actually have in our, in our cascade of policy instruments at the moment that we can see are beneficial and gives us great opportunities to, to get some further outcomes um, with our communities and also with um, biodiversity. Um, 
generally, there's also a shift to not just maintain Indigenous biodiversity, but to enhance Indigenous biodiversity in that national policy statement. So this is an issue that is going to be, become more important and more frequently discussed with our community over time. And are we comfortable that we would be able to enable with the changes, especially to the Māori land use side of things through that EPS idea? Are we comfortable that we're going to be enable those sorts of outcomes through what we've proposed? Until it becomes gazetted, yeah, we, 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 we'll maintain our connectivity with the regional policy statement. But yes, there are some very good option, opportunities there that we must give effect to over time. Okay, thank you. Does anyone want to go next or should I just roll through my questions? <laughs> Can I just touch on, on yeah. these? And as you said, that the draft exposure NPS side B is saying that we will everyone in our country is going to have to map this nation within five years of when it's gazetted. We've already done that groundwork though, right? I remember when that came up. As draft. As draft, correct. Okay. Yeah, so in effect, you have done some work, but there's a lot of work to do with testing that further with communities and um, and also ensure that it addresses a broader scope, such as identifying talent. Thank you. Uh, my next question, I was just hoping you would touch on what our resource consenting process is going to look like from here. What we know is that we're not punching well in that space at the moment, and there are some concerns that this will trigger further issues in that space. So I was just hoping you would give some clarity as to how that will be managed. For sure. Look, I think there's been a lot of expectation about the <coughs> proposed notific notification of a proposed plan. Um, because there is a ramp up of um, applications for subdivision activity throughout the district. Um, so in anticipation of a proposed plan that sets out a comprehensive framework for subdivision that is responsive to many higher order directions, including the highly versatile soil, land fragmentation, supply of, of, um, of urban land responsive to growth. So we've created a, a comprehensive and integrated framework for subdivision Suffice to say, the operative plan is generally quite permissive, so that, that, that perhaps there's been a bit of a last gasp to, to, to take advantage of that before the notification of the plan. Notification of the plan may take some of that curve off, so the, the, the rate of applications for subdivision um, is likely to taper post notification. Um, notwithstanding, we have been working not, not just with our um, district services team, but with some external specialists to create some efficiency in, in <coughs> processing consents under the operative plan, processing consents under both operative and proposed plan, so that um, the, the more complex process is, is more um, efficiently ad addressed through consents processes. So I, I guess if you like, the curve that has been upwardly progressing start to diminish and at the same time we'll be creating some process and improvements with respect to the notification of the proposed plan um, in terms of templates as well as training that the team will undertake so we will shift to a different mode from writing the plan to helping um, internal and external stakeholders use the plan. That's helpful. Thank you, Greg. I just wanted to touch on the Tangata Whenua engagement um, and just for perhaps some comfort, I know that we have had some who haven't yet engaged in our process to date. Is there any particular work that we'll be doing to ensure that we are supporting them to be engaging in this process once the plan is notified? 12, 12 of 23. Um, yeah, I think the, the capacity for uh, Iwi authorities and Iwi and Hapu to engage through the planning process has has been challenging for us and for, for Iwi and Hapu generally. Um, notwithstanding, I think we have done lots of efforts to, to bring um, our plan to Iwi and Hapu for, for participation, um, including some extra steps to support them with their capacity building. Um, but, but obviously we haven't had everybody feed back into the process. Um, so this is not, I guess that's unfortunate and it's something that we always want to do better. Um, 
and through submissions um, and further plan making processes. So there's other, other um, matters that are still necessary to address in terms of cultural heritage, for example, so, such as the Uruguay Valley um, heritage, cultural heritage investigations. There are other things happening that we need to still bring to um, the statutory plan making space. So it's, it's not a conclusion, it's just moving to a different stage. And um, I think it's between the district plan team, to Hono, um, all of council, we, we need to do better in terms of um, eager engagement. Thank you. My final question is in regards to capacity, and I know we don't have anyone from infrastructure in the room today, but one of the, the really, in my opinion, great outcomes that we've proposed in this plan is increasing the densification, because it's a really great tool to our climate change response. So in particular, in regards to a residential and mixed use, there are some concerns that we won't be able to meet that in terms of capacity, what comfort can I be given that we will be able to and will continue to plan to meet that demand that we are allowing? Thank you. Um, I think the equation for plan making for responses to growth uh, changed, changed back in 2018. Um, the starting point for that was um, uh, section 31 of the Resource Management Act about the functions of territorial authorities and Section 30, the functions of regional councils. So there was new provisions requiring councils ensure that they have sufficient development capacity to meet the housing and business land requirements of their district. So that's a big statement, but it's also set a framework for us to respond to. Um, so what does the expected housing and demand look like? You've just heard from a demographer this morning about what that looks like over the long term. We have been looking at it from our lens about supply of plan enabled um, zoned land to, to respond to that demand for housing and business land. So if you like, that's the bow wave of that equation. Here's where we're looking to provide supply. The, the fulfilment of that equation by infrastructure planning is going to be evolving. Um, we, we've been trying to work out what is, if you like, the headroom, how much capacity do we have in our networks to meet that demand? Um, and so if, it, if it's not up to scratch now, we need to make further headroom to let the market sufficiently respond to that demand in those locations. So. The proposed district plan is a representation of what we can do with what we have now, with acknowledging that further supply needs to be worked on via infrastructure planning and financial planning for prioritised locations to start. So the, the, the proposed district plan also realigns that equation. So we, we're focused on the places that do have wastewater infrastructure to marry it up with urban zoning. The operative plan suggests that a multitude of locations should be zoned residential and anticipate urban infrastructure. We know that that's not affordable for our community and it's not the most appropriate way to support their, their long-term aspirations. And so the proposed district plan equates urban land with urban infrastructure to maximise that development potential. So it recasts our, our method and it suggests a framework where you can align it for our growth response through plan enabled provisions, married up with infra development infrastructure, programs over time. So it may not be perfect now, but it sets the framework for that response to be developed. Thank you, Greg. Those are my questions. Councillor Foy. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, a page of questions for <laughs> Thank you, Greg. I, I know that um, Ms. Worcester is not here today, and a lot of the chapters are still online. E excellent, thank you. Um, first and foremost, I, I was just wanting to highlight the issue of the Monganui Heritage Precinct. Um, we're elected here on behalf of our communities, and that community specifically has got some angst around the, the precinct. And 
Originally, its extent and its rules, and given that it has immediate legal effect uh, when the plan is proposed, can you please uh, highlight what was done from the initial draft plan to where we're at now under the current plan from what the responses that you've heard? Thank you, Councillor Foy. Um, and I'll have a go at that and I'll draw in Tammy when I view, of course. Um, Thank you. Um, now, the definition of historic heritage in the RMA um, is not just about the resources of sites or places or objects. It's also about the awareness and understanding of those places. And so um, our district has a rich um, investment of cultural and historic resources. A lot of the things we don't necessarily see, um, they're not necessarily tangible, um, but we are different. A residential zone in this location is not the same as a residential zone in a high built up area. We exhibit lots of values. And so we learn about these over time. Um, so the operative plan does have a number of heritage um, uh, buildings and resources, but also heritage areas. And so in making the proposed plan, we had some specialist advice that basically said, there is a, there's a bigger story here. It's more complex than what you're currently presenting. Um, and here's, here's what the issues look like, and here's the proposed framework to address that. So that meant that on the whole, there was a larger extent of potential heritage areas in making the draft plan. Now, in a draft plan, you get the opportunity to test both plan provisions, but also the community understanding and awareness of those historic heritage resources. And so in the issue identification, the draft policy framework, the draft district plan, and then targeted heritage engagement, we built upon that story and we have evaluated and amended our approach in the draft to now the proposed district plan. So the proposed district plan for Monganui in particular um, has taken a core area, which largely represents what's in the operative plan and carries through many of the provisions in the operative plan for a core heritage area. It does extend slightly up the hill, the back of Monganui, to capture some of a cluster of heritage buildings. There's then, if you like, a broader apron, area B, around area A, that, that that identifies that there is a, a record of archaeology here that is important and needs to be mindful of when undertaking land use, such as earthworks or building. So it's, it's if you like, a um, concentrated myth approach for that core area and a, a very, um, it's an awareness approach for the broader apron. So it still has the, the residential zoning there, but it's basically some methods that suggest you need to be aware of these things when you're doing these activities for the broader area. That was my attempt at explaining. I might just uh, inquire if Tammy Worcester, who has the heritage portfolio, uh, wants to add to that response. Um, no, Greg, I think you summed it up really well. Um, if I understood um, Councillor Foy's question, um, she wanted to understand um, the difference between the, the draft and the proposed. Um, in terms of rule, in terms of rules that have immediate legal effect, or just heritage rules? Uh, namely, the land use rules that would require them to get resource consent when they don't currently need to get one, and any changes to the mapping as well. So, basically, any additional uh, regulation that they will now have to give effect to when wanting to do something with their property. Okay. Um, in terms of le immediate legal effect, it would only be the um, the heritage areas um, that are spatially defined. Um, things like your zoning don't have immediate legal effect. Um, so, in terms of the heritage areas, we we. We went back and we reworked with the GIS team that we're, we're now using just to make sure that they were reflective of what the heritage um, report uh, wanted. So in some cases, we, we slightly reduced areas and in other cases, we had to slightly um, change locations. Um, but overall, not much of a change from what was in the draft. Um, the main thrust of change um, has been the actual rules themselves. So when we went out with the draft, there, there was a lot more restrictive. 
it would have had a bigger impact on landowners than what's in the proposed. So the proposed has taken a more refined, refined approach. We're looking at each heritage area now on its own merits. The draft basically had one set of rules for every heritage area. It didn't differentiate. So we've, we've done a lot more tailoring. Um, so we, as Greg said, um, Monganui um, is an example of a more tailored approach, which has also occurred in places like Kirikiri, Paihia, um, Russell also. Um, in areas where we haven't necessarily been able to do a two-tier approach, such as um, Waimati North and um, Porirua, um, we've actually changed the rules though quite significantly. So it means a lot of, say for example, farming activities wouldn't be regulated anymore as per the draft. Um, it also means that, um, as Greg said, a lot of it is more about awareness than necessarily triggering the need for resource consent. So it's like if you did earthworks, for example, and you discovered an archaeological site, it tells you what you should do. So that wouldn't trigger a resource consent up front. It would just tell you what you should do if you find something. Um, in terms of the other rules, um, there's probably just been more of a refinement, um, probably not a big move, um, because a lot of the rules are just reflective of rollover from the operative. Um, so that was about, you know, your heritage signage rules, um, the Arango Bay, um, in terms of activities on water. Um, so I think really it's mainly the heritage one that's probably, um, we've spent a lot of time and effort um, on ensuring that we're, we're protecting heritage but we're not just taking a blanket approach where all of a sudden everyone needs a resource consent just because you're in these areas. So it's much more tailored and it will reduce the need for resource consents as per what the draft was indicating. Just to supplement, Gabby, um, and thanks for the work, I'm just interested to know, one assumes that you've had quite a lot of dialogue with the local communities. Yes, I, I, yes. Yes, I, I took all the calls and responded to all the emails with the um, heritage engagement. So yes, I've had a lot of involvement, yes. Thank you, um, thank you Ms. Wooster and Greg. So I've got, that was my first question, my page of questions. Um, and, um, and I'm really glad that the community who are listening online can hear that you've heard their concerns and you've reduced the, the number of rules and the requirements and made that two-tier approach in the zoning. So although the district plan needs to ensure that we protect, you know, heritage, we also need to ensure that um, the views of the community as well. So that, that's really great that you've addressed both. Um, so the other one that I had in this first year was involved with this is the flood hazard rules. Currently we have uh, coastal hazard rules, uh, which, you know, are currently in a current district plan. But the new flood hazard land use rules will require a resource consent as well as engineering and a section 75 of the Building Act uh, for developing an existing title. Uh, in the workshops I did raise this and that our council is doing that when the other councils currently aren't. Um, Ms Worcester highlighted that the other councils are thinking of doing it. Um, I personally uh, see this as a barrier uh, to developing existing titles, um, especially when they're already getting very expensive engineering reports, they're going to pay additional funds to develop an existing title. Question, please, Councillor Foy. Um, so the question is, um, can we just not do land rules for flood zones, please? Um, thank you, Councillor Foy. Um, through the chair, uh, the similar to indigenous biodiversity. With hazards, we have responsiveness to the regional policy statements. So policy 717 instructs us to put the regional council has minutes in the plan with um, policies that are essentially rules that we also have implemented into the proposed district plan without immediate legal effect. So um, if we were, were not to do that, we wouldn't be fulfilling our requirement to the regional policy statement. Um, but importantly, without immediate legal effect, it opens the door for submissions for evidence around, um, actually, the, we've got concerns about the mapping. We've got concerns about the method. Um, we've got, we have concerns about the um, provision of the rules. So it, this is the invitation to bring that discussion 
into the process to, to make sure that it is evaluated properly. Um, and if I could suggest the counter to a lack of inter, um, intervention is also risk management, because if we acknowledge the, the effects of climate change, um, it's a, a greater intensity and frequency of high rainfall events. And so the risk to our community is another issue that is uh, necessary to acknowledge. In fact, the, um, the RMA was amended in 2018 to bring into play as a matter of national importance from um, hazard events. And so we have a, a more comprehensive framework to respond to natural hazards whilst responding to the regional policy statement, which we're on the short list to. Yeah, and I hear what you're saying about the building act does mitigate um, <laughs> that. So I have a different view on that, but that's fine. Um, questions about, and I asked this in the workshop, um, but I'm sure it will be raised by the public. The change from the draft plan to 40 years um, as the discretionary activity lot size and the bill production general zone to 80 years, so doubling that. Um, and and Ms. Wooster had some method behind why that was changed because it's a significant change in the draft. And one of the good things that I totally agree with this sort of development bonus rule for um, for ecology or <coughs> significant natural areas um, be protected. That's correct, yeah, an environmental benefit provision. So if you like it's um it's a bit of a carrot to create some good outcomes with respect to environmental, um, environmental issues whilst enabling um, some further subdivision. Um, but with respect to the first question around rural production subdivision, um, I know um, you, you raised an issue earlier about economic analysis. Um, Tammy worked with market economics for rural economics um, analysis in the making of the plan. And that has been, um, it's referenced in the section 32, and um, it has been um, um, a contributor to the, the plan methods. And so um, uh, the, the, our responsiveness to um, our rural environment is not just around um, land fragmentation, but also around highly versatile soils and their protection. So, so there's a pretty uh, broad frame, broad list of issues for the rural environment that has uh, required for the notification of the plan to be uh, slightly more conservative with that rural framework, rural subdivision framework. But um, Tammy's just come online. I'll, I'll pass the ball out the back line, Tammy, to you. Um, thanks for the um, question, um, Councillor Foy. Um, I think it's good timing with how you brought up earlier in the um, meeting about the water resources of the district, such as the aquifers up in the far north. Um, so one of the uh, benefits, obviously, of putting out a draft is um, you have an opportunity when you move through to the proposed um, to work further on your section 32 and re-look at matters. And upon further consideration, it was determined that it was appropriate to put more of a focus on a rural lifestyle zone to provide for that four and two hectare um, ability in your rural environments. Um, so you'll notice from the um, draft to the proposed, we only had rural lifestyle around Kerikeri. Keri. Um, that's now been applied throughout the district. And I would anticipate through submissions, we'll probably get requests for that zoning to be expanded. I, I would, I would um, anticipate. Um, so, so we did change our framework. So it wasn't simply just changing the rural production from four to eight. We also changed our framework of how we were managing the rural lifestyle zone. Um, going back and reviewing also the rural um, environment economic report, um, it highlighted to me that uh, eight hectares was actually um, a promoted method for the rural environment. And that was to ensure that when you had places like um, up in the uh, Pukanui and Kaitaia area that has the water resource, we really don't want the lots going down smaller than, than eight hectares to enable them you know, to be a productive unit with that horticulture relationship they can have. Um, so the 32 report basically process required me to give some more thought, I suppose, to how it was all going to work. So, and as you pointed out, we also have the uh, biodiversity bonus lot now to integrate with. Um, so there was probably three reasons. It was working again on the rural report, 
changing our methods for rural lifestyle zoning and integrating with the biodiversity um, framework. So we still have a pathway for rural lifestyle. It's just that it's going to be more directive as to where that goes. Thank you, Tammy. Yeah. Very helpful as always. Uh, I'll go through my list. Should I ask Ted for further questions about rural production? Um, and that's the mine and whaling rule being changed um, from 5,000 square metres to, I think it's a hectare. Correct. And, and the, the reasoning behind that, because there's quite a lot of uptake of that rule and there's quite a lot of smaller allotments that coincide with the 5,000 square metres. And you want to enable additional housing. So, do you think that the increasing that to one hectare will, you know, not enable housing? Will um, not provide the provision for rural, which is our 70% I think of our district, to not have the mining dwellings? Um, I was looking at the plan as a whole when I was looking at writing the rural um, chapters. So. When I was looking at um, enablement of housing, I was looking at in the context of the settlement zone, the rural lifestyle zone, the rural residential zone, and the rural production zone, um, and obviously horticulture zone. Um, so it, it's been a bit of a tiered approach because of the different outcomes that you're seeking in those um, zones. So while we may have increased um, in the proposed plan um, from the draft, from uh, sorry, from the operative it doesn't have immediate legal effect. So people can continue to utilise the existing operative rule while we go through the plan making process. And we may find through submissions and further evidence provided that that figure changes. It could go up, it could go down. I, you know, I can't, as you say, crystal ball it. Um, but the reality is the majority of our rural environment, lots are bigger than, than 5,000 square metres. So I don't see it impacting on a, on a, on the majority of the rural environment, because the majority of the rural environment are bigger lots than that. Um, we've also offset some of that um, change by enabling more rural residential zoning. So from my own experience, a lot of the um, people who have uptaken that rule are actually not what I would call in the um, interland or rural environment. They're more around the um, outskirts of towns. Um, from my own experience. Um, so you may find that that land actually either benefits from a rural lifestyle zone or it's been up zoned to rural residential. Um, also, we have to be mindful that when you have a small site and you further intensify residential development, is the location appropriate for that? Because are you creating a uh, land incompatibility issue? So if you're, you've got a 5,000 square metre site and it's surrounded by horticulture activities, is it the right outcome to put another house there? So that's why I was also thinking about bigger sites, you have a little bit more of a capacity to buffer from, you know, alternative land uses that may be occurring around it. Um, thank you, Ms. Oyster. Um, I, I view like the 5,000 square metres is fine considering we're pushing the houses closer. Please, 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 please. <laughs> it's just my view. Um, so there's, a, there's now a 30 metre setback instead of a 10 metre setback from roads and rural production zone as well, which is going to create um, quite, I think, a bit of uh, concern from the public that may have smaller sites as well and the cost of infrastructure. Um, that wasn't really talked about in the workshops, but what what's the thinking behind that and how many people do you think will need to get a consent for 30 metres instead of 10 set back from the road? So, the so with that one, um, we changed from what was in the draft. So in the draft, we had a blanket rule that said uh, 30 metre setback from a road boundary in the rural production zone. Um, upon further review and consideration of feedback, um, the only feedback we got through the draft was raising concerns over setback from sealed roads. Um, so we actually didn't get a lot of feedback from our community raising concerns over infrastructure costs um, or not being able to comply with the rule. Um, it was more about um, wanting the rule to be more tailored. So we went back and we've retailored the rule. So the rule now only applies to unsealed roads. Um, so if you do uh, a butter sealed road, then you'd just be a 10 metre setback. Um, that 
is we've taken a more conservative approach than our um, uh, neighbouring council Whangarei. They actually require a, a larger setback. Um, we, we've gone with 30. Um, I did the 30 to align with um, my understanding is that council uh, has a policy where they put down special um, dust dampener if for certain roads that have a certain volume of traffic um, if there's a house within a certain proximity. So I've tried to align with that. Um, and it doesn't have immediate legal effect. Um, so through submissions, we could find that this rule doesn't eventuate into the operative plan. Um, but I think it is appropriate to, to test it through the plan making process because it does create health issues for residents being close to to unsealed roads, especially where the road has, um, you know, um, traffic that is um, generating a lot of dust onto their homes. Thank you. Um, so I'm just picking out comments that the public might usually ask when they go to do something with their land. <laughs> just to remind the council for this is a consultation. For consultation. This is a decision that we're making today. Yes, so this is the last time that elected members will be involved with we'll move to commissioners. And then we'll be brought back to us right at the end. So when we do propose it, then we're out of the picture for all some time. So I'd just like to raise this as an elected member. Um, so in terms of the, the urban zones, if we change it to mixed use and town centres, which uh, is really great. With the, with the subdivision rules, we're not changing that lot size, and I know that that will be raised as part of the process, particularly in high population areas like Kira Kira Waikapa. Um, can the staff um, give comment about about that um, that reasoning for not changing that controlled activity lot size and how that differs from the multi-unit development and unit title subdivision of the multi-units? Councillor Foy, um, now draw upon uh, the knowledge of our senior policy planner Andrew McPhee, who led the urban environment. Sure, I might take this one at a time. Um, there's a lot of that question with Councillor. Um, Andrew, you just have a go there in case people <coughs> mind. We'd like to hear your response. Councillor Foy, if you wouldn't mind just repeating that question or passing the question for me. Uh, first of all, it was just the change of mixed use into town centres, which, which I think is really great, but how that interrelates with uh, the controlled activity lot size for subdivision in the residential zone remaining the same. Uh, and the multi-unit land use rule being introduced, yes. but the unit title subdivision controlled activity lot size reflecting the land use multi-unit rule uh, also interplaying there. How that, how in, in the plan that method came to be that controlled activity lot size for subdivision isn't changing, Correct. but we're introducing a land use rule for multi-unit, but at the same time we're only allowing controlled activity unit title subdivision rule of the multi-unit. So what was the method behind not changing the controlled activity rule but then introducing the land use and controlled activity for only unit titles. Okay, I'm going to try and attempt to answer that question. So a lot of it stems down to the information we have around infrastructure. So we don't have as much infrastructure information as we would like. So that limits us in terms of um, where we would expand our networks and what we can contain within existing networks. We didn't look at rezoning. Um, so we have to look at uh, methods in which we can um, achieve our obligations under Section 31 of the Resource Management Act and providing enough housing and business land. Um, and so we didn't have enough confidence that we could play around too much with the controlled um, subdivision lot sizes. Um, but we also had to find a way in which we um, could accommodate the additional population projections that we were experiencing. So that's where multi-unit came in. The multi-unit also came in because of a feedback from uh, internally and from our communities uh, that we wanted a mixing of housing typologies and uh, 
you know, different opportunities basically, within, <coughs> excuse me, within our urban environments. And we're doing that also within our mixed use zone uh, by allowing residential on the top two floors potentially um, on the development in our mixed use zone. Um, the, the unit title was the... Yeah, so the unit title, we um, <clears throat> have now enabled unit title and fee simple uh, within multi-unit development. Um, to do that, we've had to make multi-unit controlled, um, which gives, you not, gives the developer an opportunity at the time consent is granted for a multi-unit um, to apply for subdivision at the same time. Couldn't do that as a permitted activity, um, have uh, certainty that uh, we would have uh, a multi-unit development is defining the uh, PDP uh, as a one contiguous building. We didn't want to develop three 200 square metre uh, section lots with three different uh, housing typologies. Uh, something that we saw. So in the absence of urban design controls, uh, we saw, saw that as the best way to achieve that uh, outcome. Does that answer your question? It does. And, and uh, the reason I'm asking a lot of these questions today is because we've had so many workshops and this has been going on for months and we've only got this little tiny workshop here that's in the public forum that people can see all of the method that we've changed over time. Um, that was my only question for, for Urban, Andrew, I don't know if anyone else has questions for everyone there. Councillor Stratford. Thank you. Um, Andrew, this is a little bit repetitive of me. I know, I know, but um, Given that we don't have all the infrastructure capacity information that we need to look at you know, areas that uh, communities said, please, please zone, open this up for development. Um, is there an opportunity for that information to influence um, the plan by the time it's adopted at the end of this period? I know the answer to that. It's, it's a good question. I, I might start, if it's okay, Andrew, and I'll share with you a response. Um, um, the, mentioned before, the premise of the plan for the day is to basically say, here's urban zone land, marry it up with infrastructure, and you can create density. Yeah. Um, so um, if we have evidence that suggests the demand is stronger for, for urban housing or business land, um, and we take that evidence into account, we then share that information and work on a program of response with our infrastructure planning and financial planning to see how we can respond over time to those um, to that specific evidence of additional demand. Now, over a growth process, you know, we'll reach the limits of our plan-enabled supply and our infrastructure supply. Ideally, you should always have a, a level of headroom so the market can efficiently operate. And when you reach that headroom, you create further supply. So we'll keep an open mind about the evidence that's coming through submissions to say, you haven't considered X, Y, Z, please provide additional supply. And then it sets a process for us about how do we affordably finance infrastructure planning married up with, with um, plan making to service that, that extra demand. Just because me agree. You agree with that, Councillor Stratford? Yes. yes. Councillor Clinton. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, Greg, you said something interesting in response to, as you often do, in response <laughs> to um, our Chair's question about matching the intentions of the plan and infrastructure capacity. And you said, if I understood you, that you base this planning on what we can do with what we have now which is an interesting principle. I don't think I've heard that before. So are you then saying, for example, that the um, development and growth that would be enabled within this new plan in the Kitty Kitty Waipapa area can be accommodated with the existing infrastructure around water, wastewater, roading, um, by roading, I mean both traffic vehicle traffic and um, passive or rather active uh, transport means, or both cyclones, that sort of thing. So you're saying we've got enough of all of that to accommodate the growth that's anticipated and enabled in this draft plan? Thank you. Um, thanks for discerning that, that particular point, because it's a good one. Um, the plan-enabled response is what we can do with what we have now. The infrastructural um, fulfilment of that equation is evolving. 
So we know that there's urban zoned areas that have lots of development potential right now in the operative plan that would challenge our infrastructure supply. Um, so we, uh, the, the work that Andrew's done has identified that we have sufficient plan enabled supply for 100% of our needs. That is based on um, just the plan enabled supply and not the infrastructural fulfillment of that equation. So there's buffers, there's lots of buffers in terms of the plan enabled supply. Andrew, do you want to add to that? Um, no, I mean, as we've said in previous workshops, we do have an infrastructure information deficit, which I know the infrastructure team are working on at the moment, um, you know, to get up to speed so we, you know, we can plan more effectively for growth. And as Greg said, um, the district plan has provided enough land to meet the housing demand, which we are seeing in our forecasting. Um, and now it's time for infrastructure to, to marry up that delivery within the existing networks that have been zoned outside, particularly for reasons on our existing networks, so we can accommodate that um, growth. Yeah. Just, just to add further to that through Chair, um, really good responses, and it comes back to our long-term plan, how do we project growth? You know, we have a long-term plan that um, focuses on renewals as opposed to growth ourselves in sometimes uncomfortable positions where we have to, have to marry up what, what, what capacity we have and what degree of growth we can allow for. So there will be some really good questions, really confident with uh, I think the direction that we've seen with our new chief executive to qualify those asset management plans, you know, activity management plans that will lead into a growth strategy to deliver for the next long term plan. Uh, how we grow the district, so there's always an opportunity for that change. Well, I'm sure you know that the problem is that we confront is that we've, development has outrun infrastructure over the last yep. decade, at least, not least of all around getting heavy wi fi We're playing back, you know, we're playing catch up yep. around transport, water, all of those things. Mm -hmm. And I really don't want us to play our way into that situation for the next decade and not after that. So. Yep. Thank you, Councillor any further questions? Uh, it was just around Māori land development. Sorry, I've just been working my way through the No, you're good. <laughs> uh, it was just around Māori land development and the Tangata Whenua uh, district plan change. I thought that was really positive and you know, really needed uh, for enabling Māori land development. I just was wondering for the team if there was any narrative around the, uh, the general provisions of the district plan, many barriers, uh, for example, the transportation section might provide for um, a marae development or uh, any of the overarching general provisions that might create barriers to that and how the council might overcome that, um, particularly given the existing barriers that other aspects like um, hopefully will be, will be addressed under the New national policy statement for indigenous biodiversity changes. After Councillor Foy, can I introduce Teresa Burkhart, who um, has led the Tangana Whenua policy portfolio, um, who's done lots of work with that content. Um, I might start with a response and see if Teresa wants to add to it. Um, um, there has been a very concerted effort to, to do better with our um, responses to enabling Mary Land. And that works at both the policy level, but also through the methods. And so um, um, recognition of the demand for housing um, is uh, responded to via the papakaiing of provisions with the Maori Purpose Zone. There's further enabling provisions for marae development um, as well. And that works through the plan, even with immediate legal effects issues such as Indigenous biodiversity. So I think um, there is um, across, I mean, the, the plan is designed as an integrated um, representation of sustainable management for natural and physical resources. But within that, there's lots of um, different detail associated with responding to these very high order um, issues that we need to address. And so Teresa has done lots of work to understand that and to help inform the plan with the right policies and methods. Can I, can I quickly just add a question? Because Teresa will probably be the one to address that. Um, so for our EWI engagement, we've highlighted our 11 mandated EWI authorities. I had always thought that Ngāti Whātua have 
Manapenua status over our southwestern border by Waimamaku, but am I wrong? I'm on yeah. that assumption. Mm. I think that they have tribal affiliation there, but not mandated already under that. Two questions for you now, too. No. <laughs> For the purposes of the district plan and um, the wider context of our districts, the 11 EV authorities don't include Mount um, And so, in terms of the other uh, question in relation to um, the enabling of um, Whenua Māori and the inclusion of a new Māori purposes zone, um, plus enablement on um, treaty settlement land. While we've taken the enablement approach, Whenua Māori is not without additional constraints because unfortunately we know in the context of our district, a lot of our Whenua Māori is in coastal environment, therefore it has the coastal environment overlay to deal with, which um, as um, Anuru will you know, testify to, you know, the coastal policy statement to not avoid um, policies and that um, and our objectives and policies there. It's in, often in um, flood hazard zones, we've got that constraint a little bit, as we know through the SNA process, has got Indigenous biodiversity on it. Um, in terms of Marae, Fenua um, Māori um, Gazette, but for Marae, they're often two hectare um, areas with big buildings on them, so there are constraints around the permeable services. So, um, Councillor Foy, you, while we are, through our objectives and policies, um, in the Tangata Whenua um, and Māori Purpose and Tree Settlement Land Overlay, enabling, the rest of, it, the, rest of the plan still applies to Whenua Māori, so there will be constraints. What we hope there is, is the objectives and policies that will while it, these things may trigger consents, we're hoping they'll be less, and the objectives and policies will not, you know, uh, will support the consent process to uh, a positive outcome for our um, money land developers and treaty settlement developers. Which we can avoid the, the policies and those um, overlays and, you know, landscapes, because that's often where our I think we have Tammy who wants to also contribute there. Next yes, yeah. uh, thanks, Teresa. If it's all right, if I could just respond. I think there was a, a question to the transportation um, chapter relationship with uh, uh, the more enabling um, uh, zones. Um, the proposed plan has actually created a more enabling framework than the operative plan. Um, so, as Councillor Four, you'd be familiar with um, in or say majority of uh, land that's um, changing from rural production to the Māori purpose zone um, and currently that land would be restricted to seven houses and it would trigger a need for a resource consent under the operative plan um, because of traffic movements. Um, the proposed plan is actually enabling up to 20 houses before traffic movements would be triggered. So in some cases, the transportation chapter has actually become more enabling um, than what the operative plan is. So you'd be actually able to potentially develop without needing a resource consent if you were doing a papakainga housing development of, uh, of no more than 20, for example. Good to be and, and, and the other question is that was really clear about Māori land development um, and or land development, but particularly Māori land, was the, the SNAs, um, and that was really vocal from our community. And we've had internal workshops, but just to make it, it clear, how have we addressed those concerns that have been raised about Māori land development and Indigenous? Um, 
Fire University is still ticking the boxes of the RMA and the regional policy statement, but um, addressing the concerns that we've heard from the public. Haven't we already had this question this morning? Uh, in the I context can... of Māori land development. Thanks, Council Foy and Council Stratford. And I'll, just a, an update from before. We have, um, as you know, a resolution to take out SNA maps. Mm -hmm. So that does mean that um, any um, land use for indigenous vegetation removal um, is subject to some thresholds um, under immediate legal effect. But there's more enabling thresholds for Papakainga and Marae development. Um, so there's a, a relative enabler for those land uses. Um, before it um, triggers a, a, the rule. So I think that's representative of the general thrust of the plan to ensure that we are responding to better enablement of Maori land. And I thought you were going to say as well the increase in permitted clearance for Marae land development in the thousand metre clearance mm. as well. Specific for that land use, correct. How's that list looking, Councillor Boyd? Uh, I, I think that was about it. My last one was about engineering standards. I love engineering standards. <laughs> 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 I'm probably using all my questions for the year in this workshop. Oh. So. <laughs> um, Hold you to it. So the engineering standards brought to the council and um, it was raised about the TP58 riders not being included and also the impermeable surfaces um, and, and attenuation or detention back to uh, pre-development levels. How are those two issues being addressed in the proposed plan? Okay, so um, notification of the plan uh, was predicated by a pre-consultation on the engineering standards. Engineering standards were also developed over the last three years via a working group, um, a collaborative process between Far North, Whangarei and Kuiper councils. And um, and the method that we've employed is to actually reference the engineering standards in the plan, similar to what the operative plan does. Um, now, in that drafting process for the engineering standards, there were a number of changes made um, late in the process um, by Kelvin Camp, who led that, who, who inherited the process, the, the engineering standards and did a great job to, to create that final version. So I understand that Kelvin made further allowances for TP58 riders. Um, and in terms of the impermeable surfaces, I, I, sorry, I can't answer that one at the moment. I don't know where that landed. Um, but I can advise that the proposed plan is open for submissions and allows for those methods to be um, tested and evaluated through the through the district plan, so you can have better um, intervention, if required, with the proposed plan and the engineering standards. Thank you, Councillor Ford. Do I have any further questions from members? No? Read your relief from the hot seat. Uh, at this point, members, it is 11.23, so we are going to break for 10 minutes, and when we come back, we'll be moving into debate. On the so we bet at eleven we bet in
So back on to item 5.1, we've allowed time for questions and answers. So at this point, we have a recommendation in front of us that having considered all matters raised in the report, the Council A approves the proposed district plan and associated section 32 reports for public notification pursuant to schedule one of the Resource Management Act 1991. B authorises the Mayor, Chairperson of the Strategic Planning and Policy Committee and Chief Executive to make any minor editorial or technical amendments to the proposed district plan and associated section 32 reports deemed necessary before public notification. Do I have a mover? Thank you, Mayor Carter. Seconder? Happy to second. Councillor Stratford, thank you. Uh, Mayor Carter, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I just want to um, congratulate the staff. I think it's really important that the work that they've done is acknowledged, uh, acknowledged publicly. Greg, you and your team have done an outstanding job, and all of you can thank you there. I thank you all very, very much to everyone that's been involved. Can I also just say that uh, to the public who are listening and to those who aren't, but might hear about this, this is a really important step for this council, for this district, for actually endorsing our nation. It's, it's something that really is important that people take an interest in, that they familiarise themselves, particularly with the, uh, particularly where it might affect their personal property. And um, so it is important that they do their very best to get them familiar with it. So I just want to encourage everybody to do that as well. I know we'll be doing a tremendous amount of publicity about it and sending those out to people. But I just can't urge people to read enough and be informed. But I just want to say thank you uh, to everybody involved. And finally, can I just thank you, Madam Chair, and the councillors who have been involved in this. It's also a credit to you all. Thank you. Councillor Stratford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I just want to kick off by acknowledging the um, great emotion that um, our manager, Greg Wilson, had at the start. And that's. Um, how I felt over the last 24 hours as we head into this. Um, I want to acknowledge that we've lost, they, you know, they've lost people in their lives through this journey of the district plan. There's been, you know, some serious health complications that some of them have had to um, navigate with Fano. Some have had babies. Um, through the time of the district plan, I've gone from, you know, to where we've got to with the district plan, I've gone from being a community board member to a final district councillor. And I really um, just want to acknowledge the amount of effort that staff have put into um, keeping us informed and keeping the community informed on this journey. And in talking about what, you know, things that have affected people personally, um, I just want to try and connect that to the district plan and how you know, some people won't be affected by the district plan and the um, proposed district plan, what, what it changes. But for many of us, we'll be able to relate to some of those changes in some way. Most of them are good. Some of them have come from higher order documents from the government, um, you know, looking at um, making sure that development is happening in the right places and not having um, adverse environmental impacts. Um, I also want to acknowledge the, the mahi that is ahead of the team that will lead out the, the comms and the challenges because we do have an e-plan um, and I'm really excited that they're going to be going out with a Get the name they've coined it is a plan on a bus or something. <laughs> they, they, you know, going to be able to get out and um, talk to people one on one. Um, the friends of the submitter um, idea is an awesome one. So, well, we, we I, I don't feel um, I I will have a role over the next um, you know however long it is three months that people will be doing submissions they'll have somebody that they can go to, that someone that they can bring and get that uppie to do a submission in a way that um, gives effect to what they're trying to achieve. Because yeah. something I've learnt with um, 
LTP submissions and also um, in reading some of the submissions to other councils um, district plans is you can't just say you don't like it you need to say why and back it up with some evidence on why it should be another way and for a lot of um, you know the well-resourced companies across our district <laughs> they will be hiring um, consultants and um, backing up what their submission is trying to achieve. Um, yeah, I hope, hope that our friend of the submitter is able to give people guidance on how they can, you know, get free, free consultant advice as well. Um, at the risk of being on a ramble, um, just I, I know it's not going to meet everybody's everybody's desires but we're at the top of this hill we've got to get over there to the next hill okay we can do this everybody um just submit don't don't um march on us submit kia ora people that have contributed to this and were lost along the way. Um, Makarena, um, Dalton, Emily, um, and, and the staff that have worked since 2007, the, the previous operative plan. So although I've highlighted in the questions that I've had a few issues that might be tweaked along the way, uh, nothing's ever perfect and that's the process of plan making. And this is not the end, this is the beginning. Sure. And uh, things that will come up out of the woodwork, um, some some different uh, submissions to add different zonings um, that would have been plan changes otherwise, so it's created opportunities um, for potential um, other developments that aren't raised as part of the current draft. Um, a question I had was, um, I'm not sure if Craig can answer, but with the plan becoming proposed, um, what, what was the date um, for that if it's adopted today? This month, uh, week, so week. Is it six weeks or four weeks? Through the Chair, um, there's a variety of closing the loop and feedback processes as well as developing the, the collateral to go out with the right pay notice so that we, we can effectively create awareness and invite participation. So um, we estimate it's going to be mid to late July. To late July. Thank you. Thank you. Four to six weeks. And I think that's really important for the public to know as well, um, what to anticipate, so mid to late July. Um, but um, in particular, I'd just like um, everyone to um, give recognition to the, the manager of policy who gives not only his expertise, but all of his passion, his aroha, and that's Greg Wilson. I'd just like to put your hands together for him and all of his And Greg, we're really lucky to have you as part of our organisation and to lead this process, and we know that everyone in your team really appreciates you, not only as their boss, but as their friend. Yeah. Um, so thank you for leading this process. So um, in closing, I'm, I'm, I'm supportive of the current motion um, and I support everyone um, making a submission to the matters that we've asked questions about. Um, it's not perfect, it's just the start of the process. And online, um, I hope you've heard those questions to hear how we've got to this point we are at today, because it's been years and years and months and months of workshops to get to this point. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Foy. Do I have any further? Member Ward. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge, um, thank you, Mayor Carter, for including me as Community Board Chair in the workshops. It's been invaluable. I'm one of those older, unfortunate, more mature, I should say, unfortunate people to have been around for the previous district plan and really struggled to get my head around any of it. And I think the communication 
um, just shows how much we've moved forward as a council. Yep. And it enables me, my participation has enabled me to actually discuss and engage more with members of the community, which is really important on the basic stuff surrounding the process and um, even some of the content of it. And Greg's got this thing around. I, I, sorry, through the show, let me interrupt. A, a big part of our effectiveness is because of Catherine Langford, yes. her role in supporting us through the draft process, but also yes. through creating this stage. Um, she's like the fifth beetle for the team. She she provides so much and bridging that gap between what we do and the community leaders. So I just sorry, I just want to contribute. No, thank you. She does. She's a, a fabulous communicator and. Um, what she's rolling out for this campaign, I'm sure, through the submission phase will be really exciting and um, and up with today's people. You know, it's more modern the way of communicating. It, you know, may not give everybody, but at the end of the day, um, I'm confident that we, with the process, that we can enable people to submit and submit more effectively, which to me is the key to it. As Councillor Stratford mentioned, you know, people don't know how to make submissions. So I think we're in a really exciting, interesting space moving forward in this with this district plan. And so I just want to acknowledge um, thank you to everybody for my inclusiveness. Thank you, Member Ward. If there are no further comments, I might just make uh, a brief one. I think I could probably just echo the, the sentiments of our committee and our appreciation. Uh, but I think what I really wanted to highlight is how proud I am to be a part of an organisation that has so actively worked hard and listened and responded over and over and over and over again. I, I don't even pretend to understand what this process must have looked like for you over the last seven years, but I can appreciate that it's absolutely massive and by no means should we ever downplay this moment um, that, that has got to the table today. So I really just wanted to let you know how proud I am uh, of you guys for getting it to this point. To the committee though, this is just the beginning block uh, and one of the first things that Greg taught me was that infrastructure planning plus financial planning plus land use planning is when we get to happy days as an organisation and this is only one of those three building blocks. So from here leading into our next LTP, whether that be through this council or through the next council, I just want to highlight again the importance of us making sure that we project growth, that we plan growth and we sustainably manage growth going forward from here, that this is a really massive opportunity for our council, but it's only if we actually stand up and we match this with the rest of the planning that we've got to do, to do from here. So while once we pass this, if we pass this today, that's the district plan out into a new sphere and it's out of, out of our hands as such, there are still two more building blocks that need to come and there's some really hard work that we need to do to make sure that those planning instruments are up to the same point and planning for the same objectives that our district plan uh, but if there are no further comments, I'm going to close us off now and put it to the vote. So we have a resolution in front of us that having considered all matters raised in the report, the Council A approves the proposed district plan and associated section 32 reports for public notification pursuant to schedule one of the Resource Management Act 1991 and B authorises the Mayor, Chairperson of the Strategic Planning and Policy Committee and Chief Executive to make any minor editorial or technical amendments to the proposed district plan and associated section 32 reports deemed necessary before public notification. Moved by Mayor Carter, seconded by uh, Councillor Stratford. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? No, the resolution is carried. <laughs> in front of us to get through for the rest of the day uh, and I'm sure that we will celebrate again over lunch later today. But now we come to item 5.2, our fresco dining policy recommendation to remote policy. So the same format again, Darren, I'm going to hand over to you and your staff for question and answer time before we put the recommendation. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. We have the report right with us and some briefly, um, uh, on the, on the back of um, really the aggressive program that we've set to refresh what's expired in our regulatory space and bylaws and policies, um, and then uh, have looked at how we incorporate what we want to where we could be redundant stuff 
that we really don't need um, enhanced smart bylaws. I, I, I think it's something that I'd um, that I like to, to coin. Um, and so the report before you today is to revoke um, an external facing policy, the Alcresto dining policy, uh, because we've incorporated that into the road use bylaws. What we will look to do uh, is refresh and actually create an internal policy uh, which meets the needs of that revoked um, uh, policy. So in the meantime, as we work through that, it's BAU as, as everything stays as, as it currently is, uh, and you won't see any, any differences. Any policy comes into play, you should see some of improvements. So that's the optimism that I throw into this report. So, um, here's another one. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. This, as Darren says, this is a recommendation to revoke the Alfresco Dining Policy 2014. Uh, the regulatory mechanism that requires businesses to have approval from the Council for Alfresco Dining is now included in the road use bylaw. Uh, the 2014 policy contains a lot of operational procedures and processes, and those it's really not best practice to have those in a bylaw. So as, as Darren said, we'll be replacing that with internal <coughs> policy guidelines. And one of the advantages of keeping all that operational detail as internal guidelines is that we can be much more responsive in improving that when we need to. Um, it doesn't have to go through a whole bylaw process, for example, to update it. Um, we can be more responsive, and that's, uh, that's the idea with what we're doing. Uh, as Darren says, all the procedures, the application process, it's all business as usual, continuing exactly the same, and we're working with operational staff at present to update the, the, the procedures and make them, you know, make them better fit for purpose. And we've also been working with the community boards. We spoke about this at the Joint Community Board Workshop on, uh, in May and had some input, and we're going to be uh, seeking more input uh, from elected members about what they'd like to see with their involvement uh, to make sure that it's working well all round. Uh, so I trust that's a sufficient introduction there. Thank you, Kirsten. Questions, member? Councillor Vesic. I was just going to move it. Oh, <laughs> sorry. And move on. Does anyone have <laughs> questions that they would like answered? Councillor Stratford. Um, I, we, when we went to, when we moved, you know, did the road to this final, um, I was, I raised concerns about losing this policy. And now as we head into um, potentially a change in community board membership with the elections coming up, I don't want to lose lose this. I don't know if it's in their terms of reference, but the risk of this being an internal facing policy where staff, you know, pretty much have their hands on it and elected members don't, is that community board members won't know. So how, how do you oh. protect um, the protect them having their voice in the space? And I know from experience that it's important because um, what works in Kaitaia may not work in Paihia. What works in Kaukaua may not work in Moerua. Yep. So you need to have a community board, and it's not just the chair, it's not the chair. I mean, mm. Belinda knows Paihia in and, not, in and out, but she, she doesn't necessarily know Moerua. Yeah. Um, so it's got to be done by the subdivision representative. It's Absolutely, and, and this in no way affects the delegation to community boards to, to uh, be responsible for those approvals. And we absolutely want to take direction from the community boards about which criteria they'd like staff to implement and which applications they would like referred to them. Uh, and it's totally up to the community boards and elected members how, how much They're they would like to be involved. still working on the process. So, so yes, yeah, so at the moment we have, we're just continuing exactly as per this policy and any adjustments we make with with regards to the interface with community boards, we totally at, at, at the request of the community boards as to how much they would like to be involved. Um, so we're happy to you know, to do exactly as directed in that space. Um, the, the internal matters are more to do with things like um, workflow improvements and updating the application forms and all that sort of stuff, but anything to do with the delegations of community boards is, is certainly still in the hands of the community boards. Uh, and uh, one additional thing in terms of keeping informed, I've been told that the um, 
reporting from district services has been just recently updated so the regular monthly report will now also include a list of all current alfresco dining license holders so that that information will be given regularly to elected members so they're aware of, of the license holders and can be up to date on that and um, it's a recent improvement in response to some feedback we've had does that answer the question um probably one more when a um application is coming in for an alfresco dining license uh, dining um are community board members made aware of the request from the licensee to serve alcohol in those spaces so um that's again um so the two are treated separately, so that licence would be considered first, and you have to have a special addition to alcohol licence to serve alcohol outside, and that's considered quite separately from the Alfresco dining application, which would then be dependent on having the correct alcohol licence as well. So the both are considered. Uh, the uh, Environmental Health Services team do actively monitor this. They are aware that you know, there can be issues that arise and they have been actively monitoring that this is all compliant. Uh, yeah. So, and if the community boards would like to be informed every time there is an application that will include alcohol, we can certainly build it into the settings in the, in the internal policy. Yeah, I, I think from a DLC point of view, you need to have that um, conversation about um, whether alcohol can be served in that space first, unless it's declined by the medical officer of health, of course, yes. then you, don't, you just don't yes. serve alcohol there at all. But yeah, the DLC need to know whether the community board supported that application. Okay, yes, so we can certainly feed that into um, how we're going to actually put that policy together to ensure that that happens. Councillor Strickford, um, when we raised this at your committee just recently, I had my comms portfolio yesterday and they've given me assurance that the public notices portion is being separated for liquor and other and that they're working on a subscription method to be able to automatically notify the like of community boards. Uh, so that was picked up at our red committee as well. So hopefully we should see improvements from that way too. Yeah. Cool. The Madam Chair. Uh, sorry, Councillor, oh, was that a supplementary to this one? Sort of. It's, it's, it's triggered a question, but I'll go if you've got some. Uh, Councillor Foy is next. Yes. Thank yes. you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this won't be a surprise to the staff. I have believed with them, uh, with them uh, today, but also uh, with the road use bylaw, I did raise it about parklet, so using or changing a car park into an area of public use to create vibrancy in town centres. That's normalised in a lot of the areas across New Zealand and I don't think that the final should be different to that. I think we should be encouraging it. Um, so um, particularly with our um, retail and dining being severely affected by COVID um, and in my view, we should be enabling this. Um, I think the question is, if we revoke the self fresco dining policy, what methods we put in place with the Northern Transport Alliance through the issuing of cars for access requests um, from the traffic safety engineer to ensure that support is given for that? Um, I can give you two examples of where that was not supported. In fact, there were two barriers created through the Northern Transport Alliance. Um, thank you for the question. That's, um, this is an issue that has come up with the road use bylaw as well. So in terms of the policy and the regulatory framework, there's nothing stopping parklets uh, in the road use bylaw. Uh, I think with the we, we come up with two slightly separate issues with the alfresco dining, and one is the, the use of the space for alfresco dining, so you know, the people in the space eating and drinking. The other is any alterations to the road corridor, so that would be footpaths and vegetation and fencing and all that sort of thing. So the, the usage, the alfresco dining licence, um, whether, whether or not this policy in, is in place, it's, it's actually already covered by the mechanism in the road use bylaw, we can permit this to happen in, in public space. In terms of the road corridor and what you can and can't do on the road corridor, that is under NTA, and so it's NTA that, um, that 
looked after that process and those approvals. I think um, we definitely have this on our radar and it's in the placemaking strategy work, which we are very keen to be being on to. Um, our team is very, um, very invested in, in seeing that uh, start to really get, get moving with the placemaking. And uh, that will be a, a great avenue for elected members to give their direction I'd like to see happen in places in, in more of a vision and direction way rather than simply just the regulatory framework that enables these activities. Um, I, I, would, I would love to be able to uh, make that happen more quickly, um, but there, it is something that we are aware of um, and that there is a real desire to see that happen. Thank you, Mary Chair, and thank you for the tip from the, the strategy team to answer that. I think it's more about the different silos of council. And I'm not sure if it's the infrastructure committee or the regulatory committee, but it's definitely uh, within the regulatory committee that issues health licenses and where this has come up. And the response from the NTA was that um, the community don't need this space. And they were making assumptions on behalf of the, of the community in the absence of a formal response from the community board. And obviously that is an issue um, that staff are making decisions that represent the community when they're not informed through the council elected member process. Um, if we don't have this today, which staff member will be ensuring that that issue with the silos and councils will be addressed? Is that Darren or which which staff member can we direct that to to do we ensure that something happens in the absence of a policy? Unfortunately, as a committee, we can only direct to our CEO who's not here today, but perhaps we can ask Darren to take that message back on our behalf. Can I just add to that very quickly? Because yeah. um, I, I know of an example myself where um, a, it is now a footpath, but it was parking and turned into parklet and has had alfresco dining on it for 20 years. And now the NTA is saying, no, you need to move stuff. Um, people can't see, and it's been like that for 20 years. Um, so it is an issue. We need to have clear talk to the NTA and tell them to be more reasonable. Thank you, Councillor Research. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. So in light of um, Councillor Stratford's comments earlier on, and, and and just the last comment by um, Councillor Hoy. I just want to test my assumption, so I'm, I'm actually happy with it, but I, was, I had the assumption that this was a delegation to community boards. Yes. So therefore, if it's a delegation to community boards, community boards are actually involved in that decision making. You're shaking your head. It is not? Yeah. Right, so, so can you clarify that? Because I agree with the comment being made, therefore the concerns that this, this uh, could end up being a decision made you know, for efficiency or whatever in the, in the back room. So I think it should be included or, or as quickly as we can have this as a delegation to the community board, which then opens up the process yeah. at that level to uh, fit in with placemaking and also contacting whoever is required, such as, uh, uh, you know, what, Kotahi or whoever. And so that's good to know. So therefore I can see where the consent is coming from. So can we consider that as a delegation to the community board so that so that at least there is a point there where a local community can have the same. So you can consider it through council? We can't consider it here. Yeah, no. Yeah. Okay, can this committee make a recommendation to council? Yes. yes. Shall we do that? <laughs> Shall we finish questions and answers first? Please? Just in relation to Council of Lucy's um, uh, question, so, so the current policy uh, is driven book through staff, and it's only if it's an exception to it's outside. What, what the consideration of the new policy is, and this comes back to the attribution of local government localism and local governance, is that the elected members of the board need to be involved in the decision making, not just by exception, but actually as part of. So, And, and Darren, I, I, that's, that's the intent, and I'm very happy with that. I think it's great, but I think there needs to be a delegation as well, and that's why, that's why it's locked in place. 
delegation will remain in place to community boards to give those approvals. Mm -hmm. um, so it will be, um, so yes, absolutely. Um, so well, let's just check the delegations. So, from memory, we did ensure at the time of the road use file, we captured it. Um, I thought off the top of my head. Yeah, Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I just make reference to the staff assessment in the report on page 41, where it actually states that um, it is, it is district-wide relevance and is not within the delegations of the community boards to consider. So I'd just like to point that out. Uh, I have no doubt that, that the um, internal policy guidelines will be a huge improvement on, on the um, you know, following on from our workshop and our and our concerns surrounding this, that it will be a huge improvement and um, and enable from a community board perspective to have more involvement in the decision making process. And bearing in mind most of these alfresco licenses actually fall on reserve, be it road reserve areas, and um, and indicate the community board. The um, two things that concern me about this one is um, the partnership with NTA over the road inside of it um, with the place making um, strategic policy work stream and how the community will get, get that direct involvement and direct voice within each subdivision area as referred to by Councillor Stratford in relation to the, um, the NTA involvement, bearing in mind most of these are in road and corridors, be they footpaths or, or car parks. That's my first concern, or beachfronts, uh, reserves, whatever. Um, my second question is around um, the timeline. You know, when, when will the policy actually come into play? Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so a number of um, points to address there. So, um, my apologies for the, the, the ambiguity there with the um, with the bit in the report where it says the proposal is a district wide relevance. I think that's in view of this proposal to this particular proposal just to revoke this policy, but the policies for the, the the new policies to be created certainly do have relevance to the community boards. And we, we did discuss it in the May workshop, we will continue to be um, looking for direction from the community boards as to the level of involvement that the community boards would like to have in, in, each, in the, these decisions. We certainly really welcome that. Um, yes, so, um, and in terms of the NTA, a policy interface. This, this is it is quite a tricky issue. It's because of because of the NTA being across the four councils. Um, my understanding is that direction for the NT, for the NTA needs to go through the CEs of the four councils to NTA. It's not quite as simple as us putting it in our internal policy to direct NTA what we would like them to do. Um, and so uh, perhaps um, that's something that Darren will be discussing um, further. Yes. Um, does that cover the key points? Sorry, the other one, uh, thanks Kirsten, and thanks to Briar also for, for um, the, the workshop and that you had done and the discussions that we have had around this policy because it's really, you've done a great job. Timeline was my oh, timeline. Yes. just when the policy might come into play. Absolutely. So we're, at, we're having a staff workshop uh, on Thursday to get into the nitty gritty of what bits need to be updated, what bits need to be formulated and then we'll be able to go back to the community boards with suggestions from the information we've gathered and to seek further feedback on the parts of the policy that, that will involve that interface with community boards. I'm thinking weeks? Yeah. August, yeah, yeah, a, a matter of weeks, I would say. August, August, I'd say August community board meetings. August, August community board meetings will aim for, yeah, so quite soon, yeah. It would be quite good to see it in this triennium so that we have something. Yes. Oh. You know, um, induction wise to, to actually hand over. So, thank you. Thanks for your work. Further questions uh, before we move into debate? No further questions? Uh, Councillor Court had submitted some questions prior to the meeting, uh, recognising that she wouldn't be here. So, uh, I understand that Christina might be available online. I'll just read the questions out for the benefit of the committee. So, she's just looking for some comfort. Uh, one, what is the trigger to automatically refer an alfresco dining application with the sale and supply of alcohol as being proposed? 
to the relevant community board for approval, and we've touched on that. Two, what is the trigger to automatically refer an alfresco dining application with the sale and supply of alcohol that's been proposed to the NTA? Also touched on that. What is the process to refer all of alfresco dining licenses to the board each year at renewal time to sense check if they are still fit for purpose and have not created any adverse community outcomes? And four, what is the process to capture all alfresco dining licenses upon renewal to check if they are consistent with any placemaking strategies subsequently developed? And she has added that in asking the above, it may be that all of the this has been captured in the internal operating procedures. She's just looking for comfort. Kia ora, Christina. Would you, Chrissy, do you want to take those or shall I? I'll hand it over to you, Kirsten, through the chair. Could I please ask Kirsten? Yeah. Um, so, um, Chrissy and Bora and I did uh, meet to discuss and um, talk through these questions yesterday, and so we have um, we have worked through uh, with with uh, Chrissy's great experience in this space. And, uh, so the first question: What is the trigger to automatically refer an alfresco dining application with the sale and supply of alcohol being proposed? So the alcohol licensing and alfresco dining licensing are treated separately, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, at, at present, the applications are not automatically referred to the community boards, but if the boards decide they would like all applica applications that include an alcohol licence to be referred for approval, then we can certainly incorporate that criteria into the internal operational policy as we develop it. Uh, and, and that also addresses the, the points about uh, introducing alcohol in the public realm that she makes them later in the email. The trigger for automatically, the second question, the trigger to automatically refer an alfresco dining application where the sale and supply of alcohol is being proposed to the NTA. All alfresco dining applications that are on a road are referred to the NTA, so that's nearly all of them. Um, the third, oh, is there anything you want to add to that, Chrissy? No, she's she'll jump in. Um, no, oh, good. Um, the third question uh, was, what is the process to refer all alfresco dining licences to the board each year at renewal time to sense check that they are still fit for purpose and haven't created any community outcomes? Uh, now that's, uh, as I mentioned a little earlier, in response to the, a recent request for more information, the district services monthly business report will now include a full list of all current Alfresco dining licence holders and a summary of the monitoring activity that's undertaken by Chrissy and her team, and that should enable uh, elected members to be involved, be involved and informed, so they can respond to any changes as they arise. Um, and communicate those to environmental health services. And then the process um, to capture all our Fresco dining licences to check if they're consistent with placemaking strategies, that's certainly going to be part of the work on placemaking. It is on our radar already and, uh, and part of, will form part of the greater picture. Uh, Thank you, Kirsten, that's really helpful. Can I ask that those responses be provided to Deputy Mayor Court in response to her email? Thank you. Uh, so at this point, I've got no indication of questions. So we do have a recommendation in front of us, but I'm aware that Councillor Stratford has foreshadowed an amendment. Uh, so Councillor Stratford, I might give you the floor to move your resolution. What, what about moving? Because we haven't moved it yet, have we? Well, it's simply the recommendation. So but we... do we need to move that recommendation to add on, or can Councillor Stratford just move it with her amendment? Uh, I'm including an end that. Can I just read out what it is and then we can decide where it lands? Um, in addition to the amendment that the Strategy and Policy Committee recommend to Council that our fresco dining applications for comment are included as a recorded delegation to the community boards. Because at, at present it's not in the delegation. Yep. So, yep. Councillor Stratford, there's an A and a B. Yes, does Councillor Stratford have a seconder, please? Uh, we Councillor moved, Tiffany? We haven't moved this yet. Uh, uh, Councillor I'm Stratford moving, moved that. I'm oh, moving it and adding yeah, this. I'll second it then. Yeah. <laughs> Councillor <laughs> Tiffany, beat you to the punch. Sorry, oh, Councillor okay. Research. Thank you, Councillor Research. Uh, before I move <laughs> to debate, can I just sense check this with our general manager? This, there's no technical reason why this can't go through. Did you just ask a question of clarity? Oh, can I speak Since to Since it should be recorded, but recorded where? Sorry, I 
Correspondence and closure is on the delegation list. But it's just simply a delegation. Oh, sorry. It doesn't say that. It's um, where should it be recorded? In the list of the delegations, delegations, which is at the front of each agenda, should in the list of delegations for community boards, would that be sufficient? And so the reason I'm moving Sorry, this, Kelly, just really quick there, just want to check it with Darren beforehand. So we will need to the first group of looking at delegations. Okay. So we'll bring back to our workshop that will combine community. So the legal advice can come to council at the time, since it's just a recommendation to council. Right, thank you. Councillor Strait. So the reason I'm moving this um, addition uh, amendment is to ensure that community boards do get to comment, no matter what happens within an you know, rejig of the internal facing policy through the this change in elected members around this table and at community boards. I don't want this to get lost. Thank you. And I know that it's been an ongoing issue um, and, and it's, it, it seems to be getting worse um, from conversations that I'm having with members of um, the public or business owners who are emailing or ringing me angry about the Alfresco dining license applications. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Tipania. As a second, uh, it would be like. Full sport. Thank Admit. you. And Madam Chair, that's not quite right. It should be recommended to Council. It says recommend to the Council, to Council. Oh, oh yes, it has. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Sorry. Yeah, great. If you could type Fully that down, that would be great. Uh, Member Ward and then Councillor Foy. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, this may be dealt with in, in the restructuring and taking it internally, but my concern is around the current time frame of the Alfresco dining licence. Currently, it's um, annually you apply on the 1st of, of June and it's issued on the 30th. That time frame doesn't allow it to, to come into a community board agenda as a, as, a, as a public item to be discussed. So that would have to probably go to the individual subdivision members. It's probably an internal thing that, that Briar and yourself can sort out, Kirsten, but you know, not taking away from the amendment, my concern is around that really tight time frame and, and the process with the community board meetings and compiling of agendas to actually get those items um, up for discussion. Mm -hmm. well, thank, thank you, Member Ward, Councillor Foy. And, um, thank you, Madam Chair. I think Christina might be still online. She does an excellent job with the um, health licences and the uh, press dining, but I've already raised it previously and it's not addressed by this current motion, is the NTA. And it's not the council staff, you know, part of the organisation. It's actually the traffic safety engineer who gives the comments on the corridor access request that's creating barriers. And um, it's not getting to community boards. The two examples of Monganui. One is um, in, in Monganui itself, and one is at Cooper's Beach. And the other elected members are aware of it. Um, the community board had to complain to the CEO because they need no input whatsoever into it, uh, including decisions made by the NTA about trees. Um, so I'm not sure if there needs to be a C there that the CEO report back to, I'm not sure if it's my committee or uh, your committee, uh, Madam Chair, on um, the NTA and how the issue of uh, parklets Corridor access request, or we can just say corridor access request, will be addressed. Should this be in the resolution? Or could it be in the question? Uh, I think perhaps between yourself as chair of infrastructure and myself as chair of strategy, and Darren has also picked up on this uh, and acknowledging that our CE now chairs the MTA is probably a, a good conversation for us to have. Sorry. As chairs, mm -hmm. uh, in partnership with Darren, I'd be comfortable to take that away at this point or mm -hmm. not to include it in the resolution. Um, thank you, Michelle. Happy for Darren to take charge of that one. Great. Thank you. Do I have any further speakers to the resolution in front of us? If not, if we could get it up on the screen, please, and we'll put it to the vote. Nice. Aye. Aye. <laughs> Aye. So while you've been having the discussion through your chair, um, we've tweaked it a little bit. 
so that it just runs in conjunction with the current motion. Oh, yeah. So I strongly recommend that council delegate to community boards authority yeah. to comment on our Crisco dining applications. Councillor Tiffany, is the secondary happy with that? Yeah. Thank you. At this point, I'll put it to the vote. The strategy and policy committee recommend that Council A revoke the Alfresco Dining Policy 2014 and B delegate to Community Boards Authority to comment on Alfresco Dining applications. All in favour? Aye. Those against? No? That is carried. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you. Okay, we're going to try and crack into another couple more before we break for lunch. So that brings us to item 5.3, Parks and Reserves Policy Development. Uh, we have a recommendation in front of us, but same format as before. And a reminder, please keep your questions uh, succinct and to the point. And Darren, I will hand the floor to you. This is a report um, addressing our Parts and Reserves Policy Development uh, that comes back out of the length of the papers uh, at a media um, We have some amendments uh, in the recommendations uh, for your consideration. Um, and we'll also highlight some of the work that we have been doing as we look at what will be the broader picture uh, in, in the trees and weeds uh, uh, space and also open strategies for policy. So, Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll just briefly run through this report and how we got here. Uh, as Darren's alluded to, the, the report that was presented in February this year, which presented to this committee the uh, parks and reserves policy for endorsement through the council was left to lie on the table uh, because elected members wanted staff to consider the reduction in the use of herbicides to be captured in that particular policy. The deliberations in February focused on primarily the use of a glyphosate uh, in high use areas of parks and reserves, including for beautification purposes as well as not just plant control even though that's not captured in the resolution that was passed in February. This report outlines why it's not appropriate in the staff's opinion to address the use of herbicides, such as uh, glyphosate, in the parks and reserves policy. The council uses herbicides across all its land classes, not just parks and reserves. They're used in uh, open drains, road firms, uh, raised medians, uh, and civic centres all around the district. And um, when we were considering the development of the Parks and Reserves Policy, and through the workshop that was held on the 10th of June last year, it was highlighted through that process that there was no intention to include or address noxious plants, trees, or associated matters as part of that policy. It was proposed that a new district-wide vegetation policy, um, at the time we were referring to as a tree and weeds policy, but it's now been firmed up to be called the tree and vegetation policy, mm -hmm. would be developed, which would uh, encompass all council property classes. So the decision to exclude noxious plant control and management from the Parks and Reserves Policy was in line with best practice uh, from having reviewed what other councils are doing up and down the country uh, on this matter of herbicides and weed control. The, any statements that go into a policy need to be evidentially based. And that requires research. Whether to put a, a simple comment to reduce the use of glyphosate or herbicides in parks and reserves, that statement in itself for intention to reduce requires research. At the time, we said that that would take up to six months to research. As it's transpired, we're developing the, well, the prize team is developing the tree and vegetation policy at the moment. And it is likely that uh, with that research well underway, 
that this matter of the use of herbicides on across council land, including parks and reserves, will be available for being workshopped with the elected members in August this year. The issue with the delay of the parks and reserves policy, should it be delayed following this meeting, is that it impacts on the staff's ability to adequately manage parks and reserves, including issues such as encroachments, acquisition, disposal, leasing, and the implementation of reserve management plans. So with that in mind, um, the resolution put uh, before the committee today is that further research be conducted into the reduction in the use of herbicides on council land. And that either the parks and reserves policy be amended in the future to incorporate that reduction, or that reference be included in the tree and vegetation policy going forward. But research is required, and I'll just reiterate that uh, we're at a position where Briar's team will be able to work off that in August this year with elected members. So Thank you, Mark. Uh, questions and answers from the uh, questions from the committee. Sorry, I don't expect you to answer your own questions. Uh, Member Clendon. I'm quite happy to answer my own. <laughs> Two questions. When was this notion of a noxious weed slash vegetation policy first mooted? Well, it was certainly mooted in the middle of last year uh, at that workshop, which was held on the 10th of June 2021. Um, Brian, you probably considered prior to that as well. Uh, it came out of the review of the reserves policy. Okay, so 12 months at least ago, possibly longer yet. Next question Do you consider the Kikuya grass as a noxious plant or a noxious weed? Well, uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to, to address that. I'm not an expert in noxious plants and noxious weeds, uh, but it's an imported species, as far as I'm aware. It's quite critical to the debate because um, you're talking about developing a, a policy to develop noxious plants, noxious weeds and trees. One of the primary uses for glyphosate in our parks and reserves is to control kaikui. That's almost a singular use. We're not managing moth plant or wild ginger in the Kitty Kitty domain or in our sports fields. And indeed, you wouldn't use glyphosate for those anyway. So it's my key question now, are we, I'm assuming you're not considering Kaikuya to be a noxious weed or a plant. Well, that's going to come out through the further development of the tree and vegetation policy. Mm. But the reason why I'm taking someone's 50 grand Because <laughs> if it is a noxious plant, then NRC, among others, would have a responsibility to seek to eradicate it. Try and eradicate Kaikuya from Northland. Good luck with that. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Councillor Clinton. Councillor Um Thank you. Um, actually followed along really well. You did it very well. Um, my first question is, do you know how to pronounce the enzyme on page 47 that makes that point? <laughs> because I do. It's got a lot of runnings of um, consonants in there. But do you? Yeah, that was uh, a I'll pass on that one. Okay. Um, my, <laughs> I, I guess, and, and just following um, a lot of our um, communities for us here in Hokianga, Kaikui Hokianga, uh, are dead against the use of glyphosate. Not for Kaikuya, but um, in all honesty, one of the biggest um, biggest issues, other than our uh, potholes on our roads in North Hokianga, is the fact that whenever council goes and sprays, it kills all of the puha. And people are very puha patch protected. <laughs> that is actually a staple. It's part of the. Mm. It's, you know, so I get Komato and Kuya ringing me all the time, um, or getting the grandkids to ring me because they've been saving this puha patch and then it's been sprayed. So it's like I, I know that it's funny, but actually it's it's like a part of like um, people's food. So um, I, I would like to 
of course, like keep spraying the bloody coquilla and all of our domains or whatever. But that when this research goes into it, like the cultural elements that are at play here, like the community elements of the reasons why people don't want us to be using um, herbicides on our drains and all that sort of thing need to be taken into account. So I just wanted to raise that. And through the Madam Chair, if I may answer that, the tree and vegetation policy will be subject to um, public consultation. Uh, and the further research uh, into that will consider such matters whether the council going forward uh, should be trying to attempt a close cut green appearance um, or looking at bigger issues with a, a more natural meadow appearance uh, may be a, a better way forward uh, in some instances, particularly given climate change and the environment. Um, so those sorts of matters will be considered as part of that policy development. Thank you, Ross. Do I have any further questions on item 5.3? Um, Mayor Carter. Oh, sorry, Councillor Stratford was first. Yes, that's right. No, Maggie, no. Um, so, thank you very much for bringing this report back to us, Ross, and um, I just want to acknowledge that much of the constraint around us addressing um, what we do on the reserves is, is a budgetary and infrastructure matter. Um, so, I am going to support this, and mainly because B is there, but I do want some assurance um, from Darren, that you know, it's not just a, it's not the policy avenue that we need to look at. It's the budget and um, districts, you know, whoever rec service, whoever the contractor is managing this, we need to look at this in a holistic, holistic fashion. Yeah. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Stratford. Nick Carter. Um, Ross, I'm just interested. This is sort of a wider uh, issue, but. We've had discussions from time to time about the fact that we have a number of reserves that are surplus until, of course, you go to sell them and they're absolutely essential. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, what work is being done to identify those reserves that are not being utilised with a view to saying we dispose of them and the revenue gets invested back into the reserves that we do utilise? Is there any work being done on that at all? We've talked about it for a while. It's so, some size near height of grass on the tree, but um, is that part of our overview? It's it's part of a longer term um, effort, I think. We we're, were leading up to uh, firstly is we're doing a parks and reserves land audit at the moment, which is out with a consultancy firm to firm up what we actually have, how the land is held, is it classified as, and what it's classified under the Reserves Act. Um, another um, path of work that's commenced is an open spaces strategy. And that's, I would say, where uh, the outcome of that strategy will lead into um, where the council has gaps in its reserves and parks and open space network, and perhaps where there's double ups or um, land that could be considered for review as to whether or not it may be um, surplus or considered surplus. But it's a very, as you've alluded to, it's a very difficult area with the Reserves Act replication process is open to public and EV consultation. Of course. Yeah. Well, I'm conscious of the fact that you know, we've got a reserve in the district where... 60 on our own side. The only uh, thing that's utilised for is the farm that makes hay on. Yeah, there's many of those. But, you know, and you sit there and you think, what the hell? Thank you, Mick Carter. Councillor Ford. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Nick Carter has raised one of the matters that I was going to identify. Do you know when that report will be completed um, from the consultant about the stock plan of our six to seven hundred dollar reserves? Yes, it's uh, due to be finished at the uh, middle of this year, so uh, in, in July. Uh, thank you for that, Ross. Uh, it was just on um, the reserve management plans and also your capacity as one individual to do all of this work and comment on every single resource consent when it comes to the Esplanade reserves or Esplanade structures, uh, structures on reserves, etc. Um, I think we've got two 
two reserve management plans of concrete and the six to seven hundred reserves. How are we supposed to address that um, with requests from the public to do more reserve management plans? Okay, uh, through the Madam Chair, we have 15 to 20 reserve management plans. Okay. Yeah. Um, How many? 15 to 20. And they're for individual reserves, they are not uh, group reserves or omnibus plans. Um, in the policy that's attached to this agenda item, uh, I've identified a process for the rollout of reserve management plans going forward. And that will be a, um, essentially individual reserve management plans for the high use, high demand reserves. For example, Lidfar Park at, um, out back here. Uh, and, and for historic reserves, which are reserves for specific purpose, specific reason. Um, we're looking to roll out omnibus reserve management plans or grouped. Uh, some of those will be district wide, um, some will be ward wide for the lesser use, um, lesser competing demand reserves. So there will be a grouping. It won't be six or seven hundred reserve management plans. <laughs> oh, uh, I hope it's going to be no more than 20 or 30. Um, that would cover all those required reserves. In terms of how we're going about that, it won't be all myself. We'll be engaging consultants to assist with um, a lot of that work. Uh, it's envisaged at this stage that I'll be fronting for the council. Uh, on most of those, but the work in behind, a lot of it will be done by consultants. Thank you, Ross. Any further questions from the committee for Ross before we put the resolution for debate? No? So we have a recommendation in front of us of the Strategy and Policy Committee. Can we just amend that so that it says committee, please? Recommends A, that the report parks and reserves policy development from the 8th of February 2022 meeting be uplifted from the table. B, that research into a reduction in the use of herbicides on council owned land be completed and that either the parks and reserves policy be amended in the future to capture the reduction in the use of herbicides or include such reference in the proposed vegetation policy. <coughs> C, that council adopt the parks and reserves policy. Would somebody like to move that? Please? Move. Thank you, Councillor Stratford. A seconder? Councillor Tipania, thank you. Councillor Stratford, the floor is yours. Thank you, Councillor Tipania. I still want someone to attempt that word, but no, nothing. <laughs> that might be a lunchtime conversation. Do I have anybody? Councillor Clinton, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's probably a surprise to no one that I oppose this recommendation. I'm quite disappointed it's come to Council four months later four months since in February the 8th, we rejected the proposal then um, and asked staff to go away and come back with uh, some consideration of how we might include the herbicide um, issue into this policy. I first brought this notion up something over two years ago, which is why I asked the question about how long has this idea of a sort of a meta policy been floating around. Just over two years ago, I was told the appropriate place for this was to have in the upcoming review of the Parks and Reserves Policy. So in good faith, I believe that would and could happen. Um, now we're told it can't happen for a whole host of reasons. Um, more recently, we had the February 8th conversation. I see nothing substantive in this report that wasn't touched on in on February the 8th. Four months have gone by. The staff are now complaining that further delay compromises progress in terms of reserve management plans and much else. What has been going on for the previous four months? We heard the arguments here. On February 23rd, I had a climate change portfolio update meeting with staff, which unusually Ross and Briar attended. I was very surprised. This was a climate change portfolio meeting and immediately what was launched into, nothing to do with climate, but an endeavour to persuade me that this was not the appropriate way forward, that herbicide use should be managed in this sort of meta policy. I rejected that. I felt it was an ambush. Um, Darren did apologise for that later, so all was forgiven, but not forgotten. The reason I bring it up is that that time has gone by and I see nothing in here that wasn't raised back then. I think that four months has been wasted. There are some objections here, the suggestion that a six months or a year's worth of research has to be done. 
I don't accept that. I mean, it would take very little actually to come up with a coherent policy in the constrained way in which we're suggesting. All we're seeking is to get um, a, a phasing out of herbicide glyphosate use in our most popular parks, on our sports fields and on our children's playgrounds. That's all. I'm not talking about roadways or waterways, any of those things. That is a big deal and that is actually a significant, that would be a major shift for council. But in a more limited way that I'm suggesting, that could be done very simply. We could have achieved it by now, I believe. We're told that Fanger Road District does not reference herbicides. So what? I don't care. Auckland City has a weed management policy. Yes, it does. Auckland City, that's a regional wide. Auckland City is a unitary authority. Under the Biosecurity Act, they're obliged to have major um, policy around noxious weed management. Um, the issue around limiting herbicide use in the reserves on footpaths and the like is delegated to local boards. There has been no chemical control of weeds on Waiheke Island for nearly a decade. Devonport, Takapuna, Albany, um, they use alternative methods. They don't use herbicides there. And guess what? The company that does that work is actually Recreational Services Limited. I'm quite sure it's not beyond the wit of the local um, our rec services group to talk to their colleagues in Auckland about how they manage this without using chemicals. There are simple alternative methods like mowing, like weed waking, maybe the use of hot water and steam, I don't know. Um, we're told that Tauranga City has a, a use of chemical, toxic agrochemicals, etc. And so they do. And the first principle of that is to use non-chemical methods of vegetation, um, non-chemical methods where they're practicable. And it says Tauranga will proactively seek to reduce the use of to toxic agrochemicals. Similarly, the Auckland policy that's referenced in the um, in this report, objective three of that policy is to minimise agrochemical use. It goes on to say that the simplest way of achieving an overall reduction in agrochemical use is through restrictions on the application of chemicals in specific areas or at specific times. That's exactly what I'm proposing. Let's identify a schedule, perhaps, of 10 or a dozen of our most popular parks, sports fields, um, playgrounds, minute, in the sense of a trial. Um, there is a reference there. I haven't got time to go through that. There is a question of whether one of the issues that we're told has to be investigated is whether we're currently using best practice, whether we're compliant with legislation. I'll almost guarantee that our contractors are not compliant with New Zealand Standard 8409, which among other things said any application of agrochemical in a public place, so let's talk about the Kitty Kitty domain, must have signage at every entry point to that area, and that signage must stay there until the, um, the withdrawal period is passed. In other words, if you're spray spraying Roundup to manage Kaikui around paths, those, that signage should stay in place until that spray is dry. So on a day like this, when it's cool and calm, you could expect that would be a couple of hours. Can you tell me that... Um, Wrap it up, please, Councillor Sorry? Wrap it up, five minutes. Sure, OK. My point is that I'll almost guarantee that we're not compliant with NZ Standard 8409, that our contractors are not obeying that. And if there was any sort of a public move in our popular parks, on our children's playgrounds, to insist that we do comply with NZS 8409, I think this council would be deeply embarrassed. I'm suggesting a much simpler route, an outcome we can achieve, is over the next couple of weeks, a small number of councillors and staff get together and think about how we could amend this policy to get just reference to, over a short period of time, phasing out um, glyphosate use in a number of sites that would be addressed in a schedule, not in the key policy. We wouldn't need to amend the policy later down the track, just the schedule. And then we could pass that policy at our council meeting on, July, on June 30. As I say, just to wrap up, I'm deeply disappointed at the attitude that this report reflects. There's nothing new in it. We've wasted four months, and I just don't think we need to waste any more time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clinton. I understand, Deputy Mayor, you have a question. 
that they, whether or not the glyphosate is bad for you, it doesn't matter. If, if that's what the community wants and if that's what the community is can, uh, is willing to pay for or not pay for because they're just happy for it to be hoary on the side, I don't know. But I don't think it, I don't think what you're suggesting is what I would. So in terms of breaching standing orders, what I'm seeking to achieve is simply put a DNP on it, because we've heard that we can expect a workshop in August, but we also know there's an election in October. So to ensure that council can still this process, I think we'll have a workshop in August forward. anyway, to be honest. Okay. Councillor Stratford, are you satisfied with that? What is the bit that you're at? Difficult to read. Read, yeah. Am I looking at the black bit or the red bit? The red bit. Do you want to read it? Chair, just in the interim, while it's been worked on, can I just comment that I don't think we have much capacity within this um, yes. council staff to assess or otherwise the, the toxicity yes. of herbicides. What we can rely on is what it actually says on the impact. Monsanto themselves tell you that glyphosate exposure can cause respiratory problems, skin irritations, it can make dogs very unwell. We don't have to research that, that's printed on the tin. Point of order, Madam Chair. Um, as the mover, I'm happy to have that timeline added to the recommendation and was I the mover? Yes. Oh, I'm happy to tip in there. have my final say when you're ready, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Tipinia. Uh, Councillor Stratford, the floor is yours for right of reply and then put it to the vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, can I just acknowledge my colleague, Councillor Clendon, and I can't disagree with everything, you know, much of what you've said, um, but we need to do the work on the budget and, um, you know, bring infrastructure into this conversation. I want to acknowledge also the mahi that the Hokianga community has been doing with the Kaipe Hokianga Community Board in this space and influencing change. Um, yeah, so the, the staff need to work with yeah. these guys and infrastructure and appreciate um, Madam Chair adding that, or was it not for the um, court adding in that date and promise for us into the recommendation? That's all, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Stratford. So we have a resolution in front of us that's been tidied up. Get, sorry, can I ask a procedural question? So you know how we we capture things that are outstanding through our action sheets. At the election, are all of our collective committee action sheets going to get transferred to Council? Or maybe that's a question I believe question. that's a work in progress, Councillor okay. Tiffany. Sorry. So, so they'll be lost. <laughs> So we have a resolution in front of us that the report Parks and Reserves Policy Development from the 8th of February 2022 meeting be uplifted from the table that the Strategy and Policy Committee, we just insert committee there please, recommends Should that be to council, to council yeah. and take that council? That be. Thank you. That research and reduction in the use of herbicides on council owned land be completed in line with the 2023 24 annual plan process and that either the parks and reserves policy be amended in the future to capture the reduction in the use of herbicides or include such reference in the proposed vegetation policy and B, adopt the parks and reserves policy. Moved by Councillor Stratford, seconded by Councillor Tiffany. All in favour? Aye. 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 Those against? Councillor Clendon reported? Thank you. That is carried. Sorry, we move the amendment for just a second because that's not what was printed, is it? Or if they're not, there have been a move an amendment. So the original okay. motion as recommended on the report was not moved and seconded. There was a motion that was put to the table and then it was amended at the approval of the motion seconder as the motion. Yeah. 
Sorry, Ms. Pierce, haven't we? The initial, the initial resolution was just slightly amended at the approval of the Mover and Seconder, so there was never an amendment made as such. So it was tweaked and tidied up. So that is carried. And at 12.56, we're going to break for lunch, everybody. Uh, we've got a little you bit said we're going to dig too. <laughs> <laughs>
holding those oral submissions separate to our next strategy and policy committee meeting and doing it following the consultation period being closed. So yep. holding the session and this resolution gives us the ability to do that yep. and we consider that as part of the process yes. as opposed to organising a separate hearings panel. So for example, we could look to hypothetically hear those oral submissions on the 30th of July. I don't know what date that is, so that was hypothetically. Can I offer another suggestion? Yes, please. One of the problems is that um, we need, because the original resolution was to make the Bible under the local government act, we need council to make the decision to make it under both the local government act and reserves act, which is what's pushed the consultation out because we need to wait for that next council meeting. However, there is an extraordinary council meeting coming in a couple of days. So the idea was to not have called an extraordinary council meeting, but there is one. That would be outside of my jurisdiction, depending on what you're at the table currently. <laughs> um, Which would mean that we could do the consultation how we would normally do it, and then the consultation would close before that oral submission, the written consultation would close before that oral submission date. We're talking about the extraordinary council meeting tomorrow. Yes. I don't believe that meets the 24 hour mm -hmm. statutory notification okay. period. Yeah. However, are we not looking at one for our appointments committees? To achieve yeah. that, okay. could be so we could take that conversation offline uh, following this meeting. And the resolution, as it stands currently, gives power to the chair to shift that date if and when required. Yes, please. Okay. If, but do we need to change the wording of oral presentations? And no, we would have two separate dates. Okay. So we have oral submissions and oral hearings, and they can both both be heard at the same time. Yeah. But it is important to have a distinction between the two. Yeah. Um, and I, we, does does it need to be in July? Like, because if we do get lots of submissions, we'd like to have time to read them and then hear people's, you know, hear people speak to them. If we push that date out, it just means that the bylaw won't be able to be presented for it uh, to be made in this training. So. So the cutoff is already very, very tight, and then that has been passed to write the analysis of submissions of about two days, um, which is very much prepared to do. So, so even pushing it out by a couple of days means that we will miss that window. So that that that's the consequence, and that's fine. Is that it won't go through until the first meeting of the new um, training. I'll leave it to the chair. Thank you, Councillor Stratford. Further questions, Councillor Foy. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And just a question for staff uh, in terms of the definition of reserve. Uh, I asked the same question for the roading bylaw, um, the use of road reserves. There are a lot of uh, legal roads that uh, uh, gazetted as legal what are used as recreational reserves, uh, specifically along the coast marine area, for example. Uh, in many areas across the district. How does this bylaw pertain to those road reserves that are used as public reserves? The element of the thing is here, it might be able to provide a very succinct answer to that, otherwise, Ross. <laughs> well, through the Madam Chair, I'm, I'm happy to address some of that. Um, the, the definition, as I'm Mate, um, same way. Road reserve is defined under section 111 of the Reserves Act 1977. Effectively, that's land held as a reserve that doesn't become legal road until the council passes a formal resolution. Um, what is often referred to as a road reserve is in fact the unformed portion of the legal road corridor, which is governed under different legisl legislation than the Reserves Act 1977. So um, if that helps, I'm not sure, but if it's actually unformed portion of a legal road, then it won't be covered by Zach's pilot. Um, thank you, Madam Jacob. What I wanted to raise is that there is an absence of discussion about that in the roading bylaw, the use of road reserve bylaw, and there's, it's highlighted there's an absence of discussion of that also in this bylaw. So where, is, where should that be covered? So I think that's a relevant question because we had 
thousands of kilometres of paper roads. Alex is on live and he's able to respond. Great. John Alex. Uh, So I apologise for that. There were some technical difficulties with that. Um, I'm sorry, Councillor Foy. Are you able to repeat your question? Uh, sorry, Alex. Uh, it was it was in relation to a paper, you know, paper road. So a legal gazetted road, but they're not formed or used as a road. It's then used as a, a public recreation reserve, and for uh, the public, it looks like a, a reserve, but it's actually legally a paper road. Um, how, how does that relate to this bylaw given that that wasn't addressed as part of the road use bylaw? We, which which piece of bylaw legislation will cover that activity and use of that land? So the most appropriate um, regulation tool to uh, um, regulate that would be the road use bylaw because it is a legal road, whereas this bylaw is limited to reserves and parks, which have um, specific legal definitions under the Reserves Act and the Local Government Act. And so roads have a separate legal definition under the Land Transport Act. Great. And I agree with you, Alex. But, um, however, when I raised this matter in the road use bylaw, it was not um, taken by staff and my amendment wasn't seconded. So I just want to highlight that to the other members and to the staff that in the absence of that motion being seconded, um, currently there's a gap about um, the regulation and use of paper roads throughout the whole district. Thank you, Councillor Foy. I'll pick that conversation up with Darren uh, outside of this. Further questions, members? No? Fantastic. Thank you for that, Zach. Uh, so we have a recommendation in front of us that the Strategy and Policy Committee recommends that Council A approve the Parks and Reserves Bylaw be drafted under both the Reserves Act 1977 and the Local Government Act 2002, as it is the most appropriate way of addressing the problems of nuisance, nuisance health and safety and offensive behaviour on council controlled parks and reserves. B approve the proposal for the bylaw in principle. C approve the period for making written submissions. D, approve the committee to hear any oral submissions, and D, uh, E, directing council staff to make all necessary logistical arrangements. Do I have a mover, please? I'm happy to move, Madam Thank you, Deputy Mayor Court. A seconder? <laughs> Council of Usage. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Court, the floor is yours. No comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the report as written. Council of Usage. I'm good, please. Do I have any further comments or debate? Councillor Tiffin here. Um, Sorry, I'll just find my name. <laughs> All right, so. Let me find them. It was 5.5, sorry, I'm just so lost. 5.4. No, I got mean, nothing to say this time, sorry. Thank you, Councillor Tiffany. Do I have any further comments or debate? Member Ward. Yeah, just a question really, Query. Um, in relation to the number of encroachment issues that we are receiving at present, um, the lack of this, if this was to be delayed, um, is enforcement of the bylaw still able to be provided under that, that section 163? Um, Councillor Foy's question. Um, can you repeat that? Oh, right, just in relation to the number of encroachment issues that we're dealing with at community level, ongoing yes. encroachment. Just wondering whether or not um, it does say that enforcement of the bylaw is provided under Section 163 of the Local Government Act um, 2002. Is that enforcement still able to be carried out? whilst we're waiting for this to be um, So I believe that section 163 needs to be specifically mentioned in a bylaw for that for that section to have the powers, um, but 164 does not. Um, so Dr. Dean Myberg might be able to answer the question of whether encroachments are being enforced though. You are on mute, Dr. Dean. My apologies. 
Um, Madam Chair, through you. The um, yeah, encroachments are being enforced where they are highlighted as, as an issue. Uh, from memory, I can't remember how many encroachments we, we've processed, but um, we certainly are addressing uh, these issues as they come up. Uh, there are probably a multitude of encroachments across the district, and um, we are only dealing with the ones that are brought to our attention. So um, on that basis, under the legislation, as permitted, we, we are following up and we are enforcing as, uh, as we can. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Dr. Myberg. Thank you, Member Wood. Do I have any further comments before I put this to the vote? No? If so, I'm not going to read out the full resolution uh, in front of us today because it's quite a mouthful. But it's been moved by Deputy Mayor Court and seconded by Council of Usage. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? No? That is carried. Thank you. Item 5.5. And I believe this is one of our last bylaws, Touch Wood which I'm sure Brian might address after we've put this on the table. So item 5.5 amended Poheringa Tide Twin Coast Cycle Trail Bylaw Approval of Draft for Public Consultation. Darren, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm again seeking um, approval for the amendment uh, and uh, a public consultation for the um, part of Brian's program of work to synchronise the bylaws to make sure that they I love the current legislation. There's been some commentary around that, uh, the Dog Control Act and the Dog Bylaw, which has recently been introduced, which um, needs to be updated and did this along with a couple of other pieces of legislation. I'm Brian, thanks for, um, thanks for taking us through this. So, um, this here is an exciting bylaw, and that it's one that uh, we reviewed in time. So, <laughs> and so we're just following that review process. Um, and so the rules are not changing. The rules about the use of the cycle trail are, are not changing. It is just the language that's within the bylaw that's being amended and ensuring that um, it is consistent with existing legislation, that we're not du duplicating any bylaws or legislation. Um, so, for example, We've rem removed a clause about uh, do not litter because that's already covered under the litter act and putting that in a bylaw doesn't give us any extra powers. Um, and the other change is to also make this bylaw under the uh, Freedom Camping Act, um, which will give us more powers with regards to enforcing camping. So camping on the trail has always been prohibited. There is no change there. It is only about giving us more options with regards to enforcement. Thank you, Brian. Uh, committee members, questions? Yep. Councillor Tepania and Councillor Busich. Um, I had a couple of questions when I went through this. Oh, one, so wheeled recreational devices such as scooters, hoverboards and e-scooters can be used on our trail, which is cool. And I noted that at the Fire District Council meeting that um, gave the licence to those higher scooters, the, the purple ones in the city, that they were looking elsewhere in Northland. So our trail, you know, could be used there, which is cool. But my question is, 6.4 on page 121 for events, that no person should use the trail for an organised event um, without the written consent of the council. Do we delegate that to the, the cycle trail trust? Yeah. Oh, okay, because I was looking at this and saying, shoot, for the past four years, we a cross country on our cycle trail, and we just asked by Adrian and sort out all of the stuff with her. Never, I've never seen it come across council before, so I wondered if that was the case, which is good to know because I don't know what um, yeah. I don't want it to be harder for people to have events on our cycle trail. Just putting that in my Yes. Fine, Take all of the naughty kids on runs from or Kai Hodes Kai Clear if they play out. They never naughty again. Um, and also 6.9, page 122. Um, horses are not allowed on our cycle trail, and they're still not allowed on them. I might have to tell the owner of the horse between here and Kai Hodes there so that he. Yeah, they do go on the cycle trail. Oh. It lives there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was all. Thank you, Councillor Stephanie. Councillor Dusa. Yes, uh, just had one question really, and that is, uh, well, I know the answer. You, you have, you, you're going to speak to the Cycleway Trust 
Nothing just goes out. Um, so, or so have you spoken to them? We've spoken to them already. So we've worked with yeah. Adrian um, in the first place to identify those issues that might be occurring daily. And the, um, this draft bylaw has gone up to their board meeting. Yep. As well. Yeah, I missed that meeting. Um, <laughs> so just just on one of the things, though, um, just just by way of information, is that there is private land included yes. in there, yes. and we have we have to buy it with the you know what yes. we agreed to with the yes. private landowners. Otherwise, no, I'm fine with it. Let's do it. And one other question for Darren is um, this one is though what the, what we did on time before it lapsed. Um, what process are we choosing so that we can get them all on time before they lapse? The next one is the um, this FYI, the waste water drainage, which is due to review by May next year, so we're well on track. Good. No, I like that. Deputy Mayor Court. Thank you very much for answering the question about the litter. Just because I couldn't think why that would have been taken out, so that's all clear with my committee. Thank you. Um, I also put in that email the commencement date is wrong. So, um, so that's because this is an amendment to the bylaw. So the bylaw is currently in effect, and so it keeps the. Uh, we're not making a new bylaw. I know we, we always make new bylaws. This is the first. I'm walking territory for us. That's why they pay me the big bucks. Okay. Um, I just had a question in relation to, and I know it's not a change. But how realistic is it that every single cyclist is going to have front and forward, forward and rear facing lines, and they're going to have them on when they go through the tunnel? And I mean, is that a is that a purist position? But, or is that a realistic? Um, so that is the same rules that are required to drive uh, to drive to ride your bicycle on the road. Uh, so we have just kept the exact same rule. Um, for on the cycle trail, so as the Land Transport Act. Yes. Look, I'm not going to die in the ditch in it, but um, having ridden the cycle trail once, um, I didn't have a light on, so I'm a rule breaker too. Um, <laughs> and I just, I just thought members of this community are breaking the rules daily. <laughs> oh, no. There's a certain time when the sun does not shine in that tunnel where it's even more fun. I did discover it was extremely dark in the middle of the tunnel. Yeah. Um, so I, I think, joking aside, I think we should write bylaws that are uh, realistic and practicable. It's not a road, and we want kids to be out there riding on the. Um, and I think the kids would be really excited to go into that tunnel without a light on. And I, I mean, it's not a good thing. I'm just going to make my point here. Um, if we put a rule in a bylaw, it should be one that we can enforce, and I don't think it's something that we can enforce. Okay, thank you we much. have it in our LTP to, to do it like that tunnel anyway. But that doesn't detract from what you're saying. The other thing to remember is we always, this gives us the option to enforce, yep. and it, it, we generally take the vague approach to all of our enforcement. Um, and so, so that's some of these rules are there. So that if we need to enforce, we can, but we may take an education approach to, to start, or we should be taking an education approach to start off with. Yep. And it's health and safety risk, which we need to ensure that we're mitigating. So oh, goodness. Oh, goodness. Do you never 12? <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Halloween party. Anyway, we've got cat's eyes in there now. Any further questions, members? Member Wood. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I had a query around, um, I recall the original joint um, government funding with council. Um, the trail started in Haukaua and in Horeke. Now it starts in Opua and is in Horeke. Prior to this bylaw being um, put in place in 2016, at what point did that distance change for this to include the Opal to Kawakawa um, section and how is that section addressed in this bylaw? I, I do notice there's one thing that says it does not include any rail vehicle on page 96 but other than that I couldn't find any reference um, in relation to the railway lines and crossing and things that it's always been a bit of a quandary of mine as to at what point 
the Opua Te Kaukaua section, which is a lot of debate in my ward area, as you can imagine, became part of this trail. I cannot answer that. So, uh, <laughs> and I'm trying to think which department might be able to answer that. It was put in prior to 2013. Mm -hmm. It was done. Yeah. yeah. And through the trust. They, they it, was a it was a council right. decision prior to 2013. The trust, when Adrian first started, was working on what the government funding was for, which was for Oriki to go and go. Mm. Thank you, Member Wood, Councillor Tepania, Councillor Stratford, and then Councillor Keenan. My goodness. I'm not, I'm just following on from what um, Councillor Cole was saying about the fact that we've got enforcement options in this bylaw where people don't have lights on in the tunnel. The signage to tell you need lights on is at the tunnel itself. So at no point when you're in Kaikohe Township where you could go to the woodhouse to buy a headlamp or whatever the hell you need, is there actually signage on our trail to tell people that they need to have lights under our Ho uh, heading a Twin Coast Cycle Trail bylaw? I don't know, it just doesn't match up. Thank you, but that's a really good point. And, we can, um, and probably the same for the other end for Kaiari. Of an RFS in Councillor Tipania? I can answer that. We do. Yeah, on the, on, in the Flagway Trust, it does stipulate that the lights must, your lights must be turned on in the tunnel. But, I mean, but for members of the public using the trail, they don't know that until they get to the tunnel. Uh, Possibly. And possibly. they may not, because I, I use it like okay. once a week. <laughs> yeah. So, offline RFS conversation. Thank you. Yep. Council <laughs> um, I just can add that I did the cycle trail recently, and I didn't know until I got to the tunnel that I would need a light. So, I was lucky I could just follow a group of others who led the way. Um, the section in Kawakawa that has been added for um, health and safety reasons that go, the cycle trail now goes around the back of the town instead of through a really busy, you know, car yard and stuff like that. Um, should, should I get them to submit to have that added in and how can they get it added? Because it doesn't go, the cycle trail route is now not on the state highway, it goes around the back of Kawakawa. So was it no? So it went straight through. So that's an official cycle trail map uh, route. So you're saying the maps are not accurate? That, that's right. Okay, we can. That's an easy yeah. fix. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Should they do a submission, or should I just let you know? Um, no, we will follow up on that, and um, yeah. And so we will get the accurate cycle trail out trust we'll as know. soon as we possibly can. Yeah. Um, so it might not be until early next week. Okay. But as soon as we can. All right. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stratford. Councillor Clendon. I'm sorry. I think I was told that I was. I recall when I first read this, I was thinking about the differentiation between an e-scooter, which is allowed on the trail, and a moped, which is not. And it could be a fairly grey line between those two, but yeah, take it up as it comes, I guess. I think common sense dictates which would be allowed and which would not. But just think about this current enthusiasm for little off-road bikes that people are charging up and down the main street on. There is a definition of a moped that's referenced here. I'm not sure there is a definition of an e-scooter. So the, the current road rules are um, consulting on the different de definitions of e-scooters and all the different oh. potential wheel recreational devices as well as mobility scooters and so that's why we've opted to change the def rather than giving our own definition which are previously aligned we've just referred to um, recreational devices so that whatever uh, land transport uh, waka um, decide, then, then our Bible will reflect that. So it should be the same rules as what's um, allowed in other places. Cheap, electric sort of scooters or mopeds designed for the road, which arguably are only fit for recreation in the road. I think they are allowed as long as they have a, below a certain kilowatt. Yeah, it's a wheel. conversation at the moment because the 
horsepower of electric scooters keeps increasing. So I yes. think that they're putting parameters yeah. around that. Yeah. Further questions, members? No? All right, we have a recommendation in front of us that the Strategy and Policy Committee A approves the proposal for an amended po heading a Thai Twin Coast Cycle Trail bylaw and attachment one to be released for public consultation to meet the requirements of section one of the Local Government Act 2002. B approves the period for making written submissions on the statement of proposal and attachment one B from 20 June 2022 to 20 July 2022. C approves the strategy and policy committee will hear any people wanting to present their submissions orally on Tuesday 26th of July 2022. It's going to be a big meeting. And agrees to delegate to the chair the power to change the date of the oral presentations of submissions. And D directs council staff to make all necessary logistical arrangements for people to be heard on 26th of July 2022. Can we change that please? Either in person in the council chambers or online via Microsoft Teams. So I have a move with these. Very Councillor Tipani, a seconder? Yep. Councillor Vucic, thank you. Any further comments or debate, Councillor Tipani? No. Councillor Vucic? No. Deputy Mayor Court. What's the clarification message here? And I'm sure there's a smart answer, but prior to correct me, why do we approve one as a recommendation to Council and one that we don't? Is there a reason for that? So the, it is about the difference between parks and reserves. Consultation and cycle trail. So the one thing is current, one is expired. No, no it's, it's about um, the original resolution was to make the parks and reserves bylaw under the local government act, and so we need to make change to that resolution. For the cycle trail, it was just to amend the bylaw. We didn't specify any <laughs> Thank you for that, prior. Uh, any further comments or debate? If not, I'll put it to the vote. I'm not going to read it again, but it's been moved and seconded. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? No? Carried. Thank you. Thank you, Briar. Information reports. So, committee, we're just going to take 6.2 prior to 6.1 because I'm aware that Tom needs to catch a flight this afternoon. So we're going to take nothing but net program update first. Uh, so, Darren, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to call the vote, Tom, up um, to talk to the report here. Uh, this is our first update to committee. Um, Tom's been with us um, six, six to nine months one day as the um, program manager for nothing, but we, this came out through funding in recent um, long term plans. So, we really, um, we're really pleased with the progress that we've made. And understanding what what it looks like in the digital space, Tom comes to us from Spark, so a lot of connections, uh, and it's really leveraging on those connections. So I'm looking at the program uh, just to highlight some of the work that's been done. Uh, and at the start of the committee, um, uh, Chair, uh, let everyone know that we have the selected as the finalist to win the New Zealand Award. So I think that speaks volumes for the Thanks, Madam Chair. Kia ora all. For those who don't know me, I'm Tom Frost. I'm the Program Manager for Nothing But Net. Um, I'm sure you've read the detailed things, but I'll just go through it at a high level um, package if you like. So, um, I've been in the role for just over six months, so it's just been, it's been quite exciting. Um, the Learning Cube, General Council from uh, the corporate world, um, do things differently, but that's okay. Um, and I think what it is is we, I've, I've taken a lot of stuff that Anna's done previously and grown that, uh, created an ecosystem, created a really strong team to deliver digital equity across the far north. Um, and that also now extends into Taitaikoro because we are, we've been voting as the chair of the Northern DDG. So that's looking at digital enablement across um, all of Northern. So we're running that. So a lot of the work we do up here in the far north and mid north is also the end of the being shared with um, other parties around Te uh, Uh The second one we've also done is I've joined the Digital Equity Coalition of um, Australia, um, and that's working with a whole bunch of other like-minded businesses to address the key issues. Um, and you guys will be acutely aware that in Northland, um, connectivity is pretty bad, um, but affordability is awful, but also the digital skills is massive, so we're trying to address all of those things. Um, which is a pretty big task, but we're partnering with the likes of Spark, um, Vodafone, Chorus, Microsoft, AWS, and a whole bunch of other providers to look at how we can those gaps. 
Um, and that's sort of one of our key tenets in what we're trying to do. We're also trying to be a little bit disruptive. I know that might be a dirty word in council, but we're just trying to do things differently because the view we have is that central government doesn't often listen to those regions. We also provide some money and some funding for rural, rural banking activity. They don't deliver it to where it's actually needed, and they don't have an affordability or a skills lens that applies to it as well. So we're trying to lobby or like advocate to local go like central government. To do that. I've got a meeting with MB next week, because I believe the Honourable David Clark's announcing something in the rural broadband tomorrow. Um, there's a rural broadband symposium in Hamilton happening today. Um, my understanding, speaking to a few colleagues and people I know, is that Northland will not be well served um, by that expenditure. Um, however, I wait to see the report before I make those conclusions. Um, so that's part of what we're doing. Another key piece we're doing is we work with the IM's teams around TIF funding. So um, it's public Wi-Fi and Pi here in Russell. Uh, the Pi here deployment's basically done. Um, we had a rough trial last Wednesday, where we just turned it on for 45 minutes and we had 38 people join it. This is with no advertising, no marketing, nothing. And they used anything between two and half a gig of um, data. So that shows you the power of just doing that. Um, we're in the process now of working with the Russell uh, business owners to get that rolled out. Um, and also Chorus is up in Pi here and Russell to talk about their fibre rollout and what else we're doing in the district. Um, I've got some more updates that I can share with the committee wider about some new fibre rollouts that are happening in Taipa and a few other places as well that are going live shortly, which is good for those communities. And I think we should front foot a lot of that and say we'll be working with the likes of Chorus to say we're delivering better value out to the right players. Um, another piece of work we've done is around um, providing value to our management officers. So they currently work in a pretty hairy environment. So we work with them and we've started to deliver um, mobile boosters in their vehicles. We've also done it for the mobile library. The next step is two-way radio and body cams for their protection and also enforcement. That's part of their role. So we're doing a bit of work in that space. So that's helping our internal people and the council become a smart council. So we're using some of the technology that we have access to to do things differently and better and be more data centric. So making informed decisions based on facts rather than anecdotes. So that's what we're trying to achieve in that space. Um, we've also worked with a lot of other pro providers, local providers as much as we can around digital skills. There's actually a digital hui happening at Tacona next Tuesday. Um, we've got a bunch of different organisations, so MSD, MB, HDK, um, Tupatoa, Microsoft, AWS and a few others coming in to collectively look at what can we do around providing Rangatahi in particular, digital skills and access to those. And then that lends itself to what we're doing at NAFA and creating a smart environment, if you like, around NAFA, because NAFA's obviously the berry farms and the construction, but I think with them yesterday, they've got no view of what does digital look like as a whole. Um, so we're just trying to piece that together and work with them and create a program that delivers that for NAFA, and then that will be replicated throughout the final. So these templates, that once we go, we prove the concept, then we go, that works, then we can move it to the next one. Um, another exciting one that we're working on, um, which I think I put on here because it's pretty new, um, is we met with uh, Mukti T. Marai, so Kim the other day, um, and we went out there to Pangaru as well. So they've actually run their own fibre between Pangaru and Mukti T, and they've got fibre into their, most of their homes, um, but no one's lifted up, so we're helping them understand what does that fibre infrastructure look like, how can we turn it up, how can we improve their mobile connectivity, their data connectivity, and skills for their people so they can learn and, and all that sort of stuff. So it's actually a pretty cool project, um, and we're about to kick it off in the next sort of two weeks. So um, we're in that sort of mantra of get things done, um, which I know that Blair's pretty keen on as well. So we just want to get on with it, have, have a bit of fun, but do, do the right thing for our communities and in the right way. Um, we've also done some great work um, with Totoka with them in Makamuka. Um, they want to set them up as themselves as a digital hub. So this is a, in the spirit of cooperation, we partnered with them. Arnhem was kicked off the process. I came on board because I know Chorus, so we gave them a bit of a rev up. And we actually got fibre into Totoka with them, um, which, to be honest, three or two years ago would never have happened. Um, I got a quote just yesterday, actually, to do, um, the old school on our first boat. Um, the trust, the Queen's Local Trust, Adrian's from there is moving into that to, to set up a uh, youth centre. Um, the quote from Chorus was circa 300k. Um, so again, that's not going to happen. Let's look at alternative technologies and how can we do that. Um, and then the last piece that we've also went through is that smart council piece. So working with things called Internet of Things. So 
what sensors can be out there in the environment to check out environmental factors, noise, dust, um, some, in some cases security, so safer cities is becoming quite important. Um, and that's something I think this committee could actually have a think about because I've got a lot of feedback from the communities around putting in CCTV, what is council's role in those sort of things. It's quite complex, but I think we need to potentially front foot it and address that and work with those communities to understand what's happening. Um, but as I said, the technology that can be applied becomes, can create the council become data centric. So very much get the information, understand it, and make informed database decisions around what's this thing. Like, like you mentioned, parks and hoods. Um, I spoke to Nina just the other day about putting cameras or temporary cameras to stop that and then create a level of enforcement should the bylaw go through. But just making sure that we keep an eye on the assets that council owns. And I could go on for hours, but I won't. <laughs> Tom, your enthusiasm is infectious and I'm mindful that Council of Usage wants to go, but I'm sure he's got burning yeah, got a very, very question. In. First off, congratulations you do. I've been waiting for you to mature a bit. I'm not talking about you particularly, <laughs> so, that you, so that you can move from providing connectivity, which I know is the highest priority around here, to providing some of the internet of things, which is actually being done around here um, as well, but also council in smart cities. So I love the I like the tune of that. I'm going to so I, I chase you along because I want to talk to you. I've got to go. So we have actually done so just so you know, all council is not a part of uh, smart cities association of New Zealand Australia. Um, we've engaged directly with the general manager, and in Wellington, she's actually presenting, so we're actually meeting. So. Yeah, so, so for, for a number of years, I've been actually pushing, so let's do it, and I know that connectivity is required, especially on, on, on the, um, actually there's a project we're looking for, for an app where you can do the trails as well, so, so that's part of that. So what I want to bring in, and long and short of it, because I've got to go, there's huge opportunities, and I like the opportunity to sit down and talk to the show, which can be actually done. Um, and smart meters is, is one thing we should be doing, our bumping managed and everything else, but I'm going to go. So, but I certainly support it, it's great. And also the next item, I support that. I just want to challenge some of the figures on those items because the, I know that how many new houses are coming in and in Kirikiri and they don't seem to stack up in some of those um, projections. Like yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tom, are you happy to take Sorry. further questions at this point? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Fantastic. Thank I'm you. Councillor Boyd. I think there's a big chance of that Tom. That's right. Well done on, on the ward. Um, it's a pretty effort. Well, um, pleasure. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions about new technology. Uh, and I'm not sure the role of nothing but net in the context of council because one of the key things I'd like our council to do is use technology to reduce particularly our operational costs, uh, which is 100% you know, rates. Okay, um, so um, there's uh, different technology that other councils are using for inspections for building inspectors. Another one that I thought it would be for engineering and, and planning site visits. Um, so that, that was my first question. Did you want me to ask all my questions or just answer each question? No, I'll ask them all because they're all known to me. So we work closely with the um, IS team as well. Because there's obviously a bit of crossover from council functions into what. So, a lot of the nothing but next is often extremely focused, but there is that smart lens which then applies itself back in, and that's going, there's a whole bunch of different technologies, IoT is part of it, those sort of smart initiatives and applications and services um, need to be closely integrated and understood. Um, it has to be outcome based. What are the outcome you want to achieve? How do you measure it? And then we get through. Um, there is just so many technologies out there. It's just picking the right ones that suit and work and deliver the outcomes for the council. So the smart building consents, all those sort of things. I know these are things, topics that have been under discussion already. Um, and the nothing but tech team is closely aligned with IS, et cetera, and some of these other strategic pieces. So we work closely and listen to what they're doing and, and have them. So what, what's IS other than... In, information is? systems. Oh, Sorry, okay. ICT, so the, the IT team. Oh, OK, great. Um, so, so it's good that you're considering that because just the numbers that pop up in my head, uh, you know, $150 for a building inspection, almost $200 an hour for an engineer, planning is $180 an hour. These are big numbers that yes. can be saved in terms of efficiency for both the applicant and internally for our time, given our huge backlog of um, The other one for Nina's team operationally would be the, the I know we're trialing those. 
uh, and I think Pi here. Yeah, Pi, so that was done through Tiff as well, so that's Pi here and Pi here. Um, they have one type of smart bin. There are two or three other different types of smart bins out there. Um, but effectively what they do is just a big wheelie bin and sort of an enclosure that's compressed. Um, there's ones that have fire extinguishers and Wi-Fi and that sort of jazz in it. Um, but there's also other more cost-effective ways of man managing rubbish. There's little mini sensors. Christchurch City Council, for example, have put them in the standard bins. You don't have to replace them. Um, and then once you've got the software, you can actually have a matrix that understands how often they get filled, when they get filled, all that sort of stuff. Then you can actually work with the waste providers to have a route selection. So it's much more effective. And you go, well, actually, if they're going to the same bin 10 times a week, and this one not as often, it's about redeploying assets where you need to and being smart and clever. Um, we've spoken with the ASIC team, so Jeanette and Darren as well, around doing counters on toilets, for example, so they know how often they use, uh, people counting devices. So anonymised information is not for spying on people. They know how much traffic's coming into, for example, Kitty Kitty, how many people are using the public toilets, where are they using them, where do, where do people actually go? So those sort of things, those sort of metrics are actually really important from a council perspective long-term planning, so you actually know where people are going, what shops are popular, all that sort of stuff. Um, it's all available now, and it's just a matter of just working through, as I said, truth of concepts that deliver um, real outcomes for the community, but also for council, because it's going to be a two-way piece, so council can make really good decisions around their investments in the future and their assets and managing those assets. Excellent. Does it make so, sense? Yes, no, it makes sense. The last one about the operational one was the either GPS or some sort of technology to show the frequency of which reserves are getting loaded and how often. So the reason I ask this now is that we're currently doing the contractual review of our parks and reserves and uh, then who that contract might be. So if, if we know how much these technologies will cost and we work that into the contract, then not only will we have better data in order to manage uh, the day we're going to manage to see what level of service we're physically getting, yep. um, we can also budget for that. Yep. Um, so I don't know, I think key that deals with the contracts. Um, I'm more than happy to have a conversation because I think, as I said, the tech, GPS stuff on miles and those sorts of things is quite common. Yes. Um, in other, some other districts are trying it. Um, Australia's quite a way ahead. Um, but Hamilton's doing a good job, Wellington, Christchurch, Christchurch particularly because they'll receive that after the earthquake funding. Um, but smart cities is something that I think far north in particular as a district has a real opportunity to become a leader in that space at a regional level. So the Totokare region, but also Whanganui's, you know, looking for some of those people to help out um, Parafiti, etc. There's an opportunity for us to be a little bit clever about how we do it and partner well uh, and get those outcomes for the communities, but also the council as well. Thank you, Minchia. I don't have any other questions, but it's just a point of clarification, Darren. Um, if we were to request a paper to know how much these capital operational costs would be for these types of technologies in advance of the new contract renewals, um, would that be a notice part of this paper or a formal request for a paper to come to either the infrastructure committee or maybe, I don't know if it's a the ARC committee, one of the committees, so that we can get this information in advance so that we can include it in our contracts, or is it operational cost, uh, cost in advance of the contracts? I'm aware that it's been live streamed, but in, can we add this as an, a note, Madam Chair, just so that um, so that it's an action because we need it in advance of the contracts, the information about these costs and are you, happy, are you happy to pick that conversation up as Chair of the Infrastructure Committee? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we'll just put it in the notes as well. So If you could just shake something up and pop it in the chat. Uh, and then we can discuss it as part of the debate. Do I have any further questions for Tom? Let's point me more forward. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Tom, I have several questions. One, um, our library in Pai here is, um, has been receiving, and I'm not sure if we still are, a seasonal subsidy in relation to Wi Fi use. The TIP funding for, for the usage that we now have um, centrally here, is, is that 
um, going to affect the service offered at the library? No. Will, will it improve people hanging in the grounds and on the footpath is what I'm asking badly, I guess. But potentially, that's one of the challenges of the public Wi-Fi initiatives is figuring out um, where people will congregate. I know there's been potential issues in car car in the past, so we can turn it off at 10 o'clock at night, for example. We can set parameters and those sort of things, so we have rules, but it won't impact the library um, connection. As far as I'm aware, the fibre's getting installed in the library shortly. I was just working with Chorus yesterday, so. So is council still benefiting from the, the visitor subsidy over the library Wi-Fi? That would still apply, yeah. So APNK. I want to get one of those other acronyms, is what's provided in libraries, that affects their public Wi-Fi. Yeah, that, that funding, as far as I'm aware, wouldn't change. The TIF funding was primarily for Pai here and Russell from the visitor perspective, and this is in preparation for cruise ships coming back on board and getting people more engaged, um, and the communities more engaged as well. Um, we're using that as a template for other communities to do that as well. So once we've got it ironed out, then places like Kaikui will get it, Kaitaia, et cetera, and other places in need. We've selected around 30-odd towns uh, within the FNDC district to provide public Wi-Fi to. Thank you. And um, my second question, um, I did note that I got an email saying that Cora's up coming um, to engage with the community um, soon, yep. the play here. And I just, my query was really around the, the venue, um, the play here club. Um, I'm wondering why the Paihe Hall is a central community facility with um, better airflow and and not having to sign in as a non-member wasn't yeah. chosen um, for for more effective engagement. Good, good point, and I'll take that feedback to Jo from Chorus. So she's the community liaison officer that deals with um, councils. Um, basically, the site, so it's out of our control, and it's already pre-done. So I'm catching up with Jo in the next couple of weeks, and I'll just say let's select a bit of you next time. Um, and I think there should be a roadshow about what Chorus has done and what we've done in partnership with them, because um, a lot of it's not very clear. Um, and some of the uptake in some parts of um, Taitaikurei, I'll use Mūrira as an example. They've got fibre that had it for over a year. The uptake's pretty poor, and the government goes, why? And you go, well, people can't afford it. And they go, oh, OK. Um, but they don't seem to worry about that. So that's what we're trying to do, is do something slightly different and create that affordability lens. So the DECA group I mentioned before, the Digital Equity Group, um, we advocate for, we've got people from Two Ends, Chorus, um, ourselves and other councils and other businesses to going to the government to say, you have to look at things differently. You can't just book fibre in and take people have got it and say, pick yourself in the back and say, we've done a great job when you haven't. Uh, people aren't connecting and they aren't getting access to, you know, as Felicity said, those, those online services from government and local government, if they're not getting access to it, they're going to be more and more deprived and that's not taken into account. So that's what we're trying to uh, um, change. My final question just was in relation to, um, they've been rolling out fibre in the area for a long time, and I'm getting many, many questions and queries over um, when can people connect. It's, there's a frustration over the fact that there's such a time lapse, yep. and I'm not sure whether I'm just not getting the information or not, don't know where to look, or whether that hasn't actually been announced yet. Is this part of this? Uh, uh, which sites are these in particular? Or what? As, as, in the township yep. and in the particular Paihe area, they seem to roll out of the tourist or visitor areas first, and um, it's, it's there and no one can connect. So it's. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I can't influence some of the chorus decisions. A lot, so the way chorus is funded for um, UFB 1 and 2, so the ultra fast world band, is government says, here's a bunch of cash, do these towns, and they set a very pretty strict perimeter. Then they have they go and roll it out, and then they'll have a platform. This is why Joe's going out to tell people about fibre accessibility. Um, I'm going to be honest, of course, it's pretty useless um, at doing that, and they're not they're not that good at the end game. Um, they just need to improve that. We <laughs> have an opportunity to do with the connections itself. Yeah, yeah. And, and if you look, to be honest, if you're literally just outside the UFB zone, the answer is no, or it's going to cost a lot of money. Um, so we can work closely with the likes of Chorus. So I think we need to get better at that to advocate for our communities to do a better job and get them to communicate better. Um, that's, that's Thanks, take. I'll, I'll take that question to Chorus when they come to town. Yeah, no, give, give Joe Thank you. Thank you, Belinda. Further questions, members? No? Okay, so we have a recommendation in front of us that the strategy and policy committee received the report, nothing but net program update. We also have a note to the effect of note action point that a paper be provided by the nothing but net team to the infrastructure committee or to the infrastructure 
to the infrastructure committee on the options and costs for technology for data input in regard to rubbish bins public toilet usage, frequency of use and cleaning, and the frequency of mowing of each reserve, that recommendations be provided for the use of such technology as part of the new reserve and public amenity service contract that is coming up for review. Is that a note? I feel like that was probably a resolution by stealth councillor Foy. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't write that, councillor Foy wrote that. I just, just think on that, I, I don't mind doing that um, at all. Um, it's just, I think we need to sit down and find out and get the clarity of the outcomes because as I said, there's so much IoT stuff out there. Um, it's just making sure we make proper informed decisions around the most appropriate tech and most affordable. Because mm -hmm. in some cases you can buy or run it and there's going to be a maintenance program, all that sort of stuff. So just understanding the holistic picture. But more than happy to help. That's what okay. we're going to do anyway. Councillor Foy, um, because it's requesting a report, I think that it needs to be a resolution as right. opposed to just a note. So if you want to propose that, is it an and that? Yeah. Would somebody like to second Councillor Foy's amendment? I'm happy to second. It's not an amendment because we don't have a resolution on the table. I'm, can't, I'm happy to move the whole thing. Oh, I'm yeah. the whole thing. So. Moved and seconded. Thank you. Uh, do you want to speak to that any further? Just that great timing, and of course we need to save money and time and have efficiency given our giant geographic area budget. And I think the other yeah, thing, the other, that's right, the other thing that's with IoT is that you can engage and empower the communities to be better informed, and I think that's really powerful. Um, a lot of councils use it for internal stuff rather than externally presenting some of that detail, but it's pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Councillor Stratford, any further comments? No, thank you. Any comment or discussion, debate on the resolution in front of us? No? If so, we will put it to the vote. Aye. Aye. In front of us, there. Yeah. All in favour? Aye. Those against? No, carried. Tom, thank you for your time. Safe travels. Second to last report. Item 6.1, far more district population oh, projections. Uh, we really hit that question, uh, Just briefly, thank you. Uh, item 6.1, 15 Policy Committee received the report, far more district population projections moved by Councillor Tiffany. Do I have a second, please? Thank you, Deputy Court Darren. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm uh, following with Councillor Tiffany on the his lead on this one. We have a good presentation this morning from the um, I hope have a bit of a dad for that presentation. Um, just to anything that you might want to all, all I would briefly add would be just to say that there's an interactive online dashboard of the projections on its way very, very soon, and that the projections will also be updated uh, annually the next two years. That's already locked in too, so it's all well done. Question, my only question would be in the interest of efficiency if that online uh, dashboard is, will that be uploaded into the Native Members Lounge? It hasn't arrived yet, but I presume yes. So we'll, we will certainly be finding a way to get it to you as soon as it arrives. We are awaiting it any day. So great. It would be great if we had a question section within yeah. that as well, in the similar format that we've followed with previous items. Just, um, just on that, it'll be delivered by our website, so it'll be, we've access, it'll be publicly accessible as well. Okay. Well, if we could have an area set up within the elective members lounge for any uh, further questions, etc., to be answered in a cost efficient way. Great. Thank you. Any further questions, members? Councillor Court. My question relates to the transit planning. When I read this, naturally, you go and check out where you live. Um, you all do that, don't we? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And it came up in the. Um, like a structure plan conversation that I note that where I live, uh, we're outside the boundary for the structure plan. And I don't live too far from Roger, so he knows where I live. And I know that there's over 90 houses on my road. Um, and we're not captured. And I thought, if we're not captured, how do we actually know when we're coming to town planning to plan for all of those people? Because Kiri Kiri is our town. It's our only town. It's where we go. We go to the supermarket. We go to the bank. We go to the doctor. We go there. And then I started to think about other towns. And I thought, actually, I'll go to Kaikoui. 
But the Kai Koi's got the supermarket, so everybody would come here. And we all still have to come to you too. Yeah. We'll yeah. You would all come here. Yeah. And the same with Kai Taya. So if you're in Takao, you still have to come down to Kai Taya. And I was just thinking as you do at 3 o'clock in the morning, how on earth do you plan for the transport needs of a district when the messaging is so broken down, so compartmentalised and so tiny in their subgroups that perhaps we lose sight of the forest because we're looking at individual trees. So when I think about the, the crisis, and it is a crisis that's looming in Kerry Kerry with regard to managing all the people that are going to live here on the network, um, yet the information says, well, you've actually only got 13,000 people, what are you complaining about? Uh, we've only got roads at this rate. You're all going to pop off the cobs. It's in the mail, isn't it? A death are all in the mail. I think that's what he gets this morning. <laughs> um, and, and that creates a whole bunch of challenges. And for Kiri Kiri and Wanganui, it's different because council is responsible for transport planning. But for everybody else in the district, Moka Kotahi is responsible for your transport planning. And then I have areas like high uh, here in areas like Okanoni that have huge influxes of tourists and the, the transport task as a coping. So I'm rambling, Madam Chair, I'll get to my point. My point is how do I use this information in a way that would enable proper transport planning? Through the chip on that. So um, so there's a number of things in there on what you just said, um, and around the catchment, and the catchment of Kitty Kitty Waikapa. Um, and um, one of the things that we are constantly talking about is the labour and housing market, so to speak, and the fact that um, that these towns are servicing a wider population base than just what you're seeing in those SA2 areas which are which we're defining under that catchment. That original catchment was the, from the structure plan. So, and, and, and as you rightly stated, there's a lot of places, uh, you know, Pongairi Road, Waimati North, those areas which are quite popular and have been growing in population, pretty much because people have been allowed to build there because we haven't um, control of the growth out of those areas. So, um, and, we, and you've heard from this plan today around intensification. So, you know, but that's uh, that's done deal. It's already already happened. Um, and hopefully, you know, that will be um, constrained potentially through the district planning processes that are going on. But that doesn't take away the fact that population is at that, that number. And um, and I seriously think you need to consider as part of the spatial planning pro process. It's not just transport planning. It's um, it's also um, it's also where you put the reserves. Um, so how many you know, what sort of amenities do you need? Um, but that also comes around the livability of the, of the centre of the, the town as well, and what that means for where, where growth might go. Um, so you've heard from the district plan and they're, they're saying we've got um, capacity and, um, and like capacity in land. The question is what sort of growth you want to have around the place to service the population. And more importantly, um, what sort of people are going to live in there, what sort of um, incomes they're going to have as well. Because um, that all plays into, into, part, into it as well. Because you, um, um, there's a big question mark around where do the people live who work in the service industry, for example. Where are they travelling from to get to, do, to jobs and where are the jobs? So part of the system that um, we're not doing further than that is doing a little bit of looking at that around some of the wellbeing outcomes we're trying to achieve. Because it's it's transport, but it's also employment. It's also localities of, of your centres. Uh, Kitty Kitty um, Waipapa area is growing um, a lot. Um, is that going to be a future employment centre? Um, is it going to be residential? Is it going to be a town centre? It's, um, it's growing sort of um, in a way which I don't think um, you mentioned it yourself, saying you, you like you drive down there and, and it's coming up with a big box area without any design going on. So there's a lot of factors playing into all of this. Um, but from a population point of view, um, I asked him to do that, um, what he thought was the estimated population for that for the structure plan area, which was the original boundary, um, which I found out which, which is based on school boundaries, which was at 30,000, which is by, by 3,000 above the 10,000 limit, um, which is the limit for a tier three, I keep what I say here because people are arguing whether we're a tier three or not, and there's a big, um, there's a big question mark about whether we cross over to be a tier three under the NPSUD, the whole lot of rules kicking in. So um, there's a lot to consider um, for long.
long-term planning in that 10, 30-year period and what that actually means. And I don't dare throw on top of the cost of that climate change um, because we're looking at flooding as well and um, there's a lot of stuff that's coming through. The national adaptation thing around what we need to, need to do around housing, housing and building, getting up to speed. So I'm just, I'm just putting it out there that I'm hopeful that the question is not so much around transport planning, it's something like that. Thank you, Roger. I, I would have been happy if it had captured in here as well, Madam Chair. Um, and look, it's great. I found it really, really, really interesting. But I do know that. I think if we're scared of the conversation, if I'm being really honest, I think we are so. If we were really honest about the growth in the Kirikili Waipipi area, and I'm not saying you're not, not, it's just a hypothetical thing. We don't want it to, to boomerang up to the next level because that creates a whole bunch of challenges for us as an organisation about what we have to do. So mm -hmm. it's convenient for it not to be at that tier. Mm -hmm. And the, the, I call it Pac-Man, the, the boundary there yeah. for the structure hand, it looks like Pac-Man for those of you in my generation. <laughs> Remember the gaming machines? There's not many in this room. Um, I have Pac-Man socks. <laughs> socks. I have Pac-Man undies. <laughs> I'm just... Is that my mood? If I can say this with love, and I know it's going to come out sounding really awful, but I'm saying it with love. Is it convenient to keep constraining us down and down and down and therefore get out of having those big, hard conversations about what's really required? Um, because I don't think that boundary is anywhere near realistic. And I think we're setting ourselves up for failure, but that's aside from this report. Yeah. Do we, do we get to choose that though? In these reports, they go to the smallest mesh block or whatever that yeah. StatsNZ uses. Whereas are we able for, like in the future ones of these, we're asking for greater questions. Can we say actually, we want the, the urban population yeah. of the Township of the catchment area, not don't mesh block it for us. Yeah, so I think about Kaiko, for example, and, and what we're doing at NAFA and the water dams and these amazing soils mm -hmm. and all of the wonderful potential that's going to happen in Kaiko. But your labour force might not be here, your labour force might come out from Makiya, mm -hmm. some might come over from Kirikiri, they might come from all over. So when we plan for that, we have to look far bigger than what the number on this page says. Far, far bigger. And I'm seeing it in Kaitai now with all the avocado orchards and everything that are establishing um, up towards Pukanui. And I'm not, I guess, like, I'm not sure that's entirely helpful unless we're prepared to extrapolate it out and put it into the overlay of what Council does. And that's where you're talking I, about. Can I just respond to that? So, so oh, on, sorry, the, on the I'm urban area, area and, and just responding to the question around the urban area, you know, you're hearing about intensification, you've heard from the, the district plan and what it means about that population basis on, and if we, you know, if we zone, we hone in on the urban areas, people living in urban area, but I'll just come back to what I said before. It, 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 and just following from your, um, your observation, as, as who does it service? So the, so the, the terminology that, that's used is it's a labour and housing market. So um, the labour market is the who's travelling to work, and um, and now I guess also it's the servicing as well. Who's travelling to, to to get to use those services, and then there's the housing market as well, and who actually where are the people living? Um, so we've had a conversation we've heard from the district plan today around the you know what we can enable in the way of housing, but it's a topology of housing as well. And I'll just add to that um, to that one is um, at the moment we're enabling, and this is what we from the developers now they were coming out and saying we need more different build topology, different types of housing to meet the different um, people's uh, capability to pay because we're hearing about all the sorts of affordability issues that are going on right now and they're just increasing. So the question you've got to ask is, is simply, and this has been pushed back at us a bit from some of the government agencies, where do the people live who work in these industries? Because that's really the question and, and, and where are we going to enable them to, to, to live? Um, so we're doing intensification, but more importantly, if we do intensification, what sort of place are we creating as part of intensification? Um, do we want parts of everywhere? Townhouses? Or do we want to enable a different type of housing around the place that's going to allow for a mixture of homes, um, 
family homes, apartments, townhouses, um, or a combination of that. And um, it's coming around to some of the things we've bought, it's coming around the DP about some design standards as well. So yeah, we're getting a bit of pushback around, do we have design standards for our roads, for example, which we don't. So we don't have any um, anything around how we design our roads and design our streets um, and what they look like. So there's some things that we're facing head on as part of the, the spatial planning project at the moment, and we are considering you know, what that might look like going forward. Does it? Does it? Oh, sorry, if I may, Madam Chair, I'll just to label my point. I looked at the page here that talks about Kirikiri white paper, and it talks about the population of the structure span is 30,600. Then it talks about projected annual change, and they are small numbers. Who goes to Kitty Kitty? Well, I know 11,000 vehicles a day go down Kitty Kitty Road more than go on the state highway. I know that. Everybody goes to Kitty Kitty because that's where the supermarket is. So the catchment would go all the way up to probably Taupo Bay. And exactly the same scenario for Kaiko. We plan for, and I've started off transport planning. I'm planning for the transport task, and I look at the, and it tells me, I can't, I can't find it now. Say it's a clay going in, 4,800. And my planning is 4,800, or I'm planning for everybody that comes in here. Not the people that live here, but the people that will come in here on a daily basis. For commerce and education and entertainment and all of those other things. So it's a supplementary data set, almost. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm just making a point that I, I think it's too small to help us really understand the drivers of internal movements in the district to help us plan. Yeah, so one of the, Roger's going to correct me. So one of the questions I got from that, kind of asked them, that's part of the further study, is where are people travelling from? Um, and you know, you travel to, for the service for the come to town to, you know, to do shop, for example. And then there's people who are travelling for work, and he's going to have a look at the city. Central government has that. When we looked at the mapping for when they split our district into an alert level three, alert level two, they based it. They had commuter commuter zone lines that came from the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet. And I feel like if the Prime Minister or who was here, the Prime Minister wasn't in our district. Our entire district would have gone level three. When you looked at those commuter lines that crossed across the Border, but that exists, that data set will be in our email somewhere when they decided on the border. And the cat's right. Where do we go from here, Deputy Mikko? Oh, that's just just information report, Madam Chair. I was just making an observation yeah. that I'm not quite comfortable yet that we're collecting the right data sets. I think that's a really fair question to ask in a conversation that I think we need to continue having, especially acknowledging that as we shift into a more regionalised planning based approach as well, you know, we can sit at the table and we can challenge these figures because we live in those times and we live in those spaces and we understand that. But when our planning is being done from a regional level, that's no longer going to exist. So I think now is the right opportunity for us to be making sure that our data that we're using to inform our planning is is accurate. So I don't know what the mechanism to, is to consider having this or continue having this conversation. I guess it's around the spatial plan, but I'll come back to you on that one. Uh, Councillor Clendon, <coughs> lost my words, and then Member Ward. Yeah, um, just to add, I was just reminded when I was teaching, particularly around sort of sustainable urban design, the, I guess one of the key principles was always zoom in to your site, to your project, whatever, but, but then zoom out. And that's going to be a constant iteration. You look at your local, your little the design of your particular development, whatever, but constantly zoom out, look at that bigger picture. How do all the bits that cross over the ecology, actually, mm -hmm. ecosystem management? Same thing. And that is the dilemma. You know, we've got this. I read a traffic planner's um, assessment recently where the person who wrote it was absolutely determined not to look outside of the boundaries of the one subdivision being addressed. Didn't want to know about the impact of that intervention on the wide area. And it comes through the trumps, you know. And that's what we've got to push back against that, that sort of focus on the minute rather than looking at the, the interactions and if X happens, what happens over here and why. So it's, it is a dilemma. Um, I think my only comment on these forecasts is projections of population. I always take them with a huge helping of salt, you know. You can't rely on we, we haven't we have to rely 
on top of it, we have to make assumptions as a population that grow, fall, or stay the same. But if we can't hang our hat on any of this, it's just not accurate enough. Um, the question I asked this morning, you know, they are assuming 132, I think, extra jobs in horticulture. The people putting up $60 million into creating water resources for horticulture are assuming 450, I think it was. Um, and frankly, I trust the latter more because they based that on knowing that for kiwi fruit, this X number, I think it's they assume 0.5 FTE per hectare under under kiwi fruit. With avos, it's about 0.3 of an FTE per hectare of avocados. You know, these are fairly. This is based on observation and history. I don't know where they got the 132 from. Doesn't tell me. The other thing, you know, they talk about there'll be an average 0.7 percent per annum growth between now and 2034. So you assume this lovely little progressive graph going like that. Look what's happened since 1997 on page 139. Population growth has gone like that, you know. It spikes, it, it peaks and hollows. It looks like a, a cardiogram of somebody in very bad shape with their heart, you know. So you can't assume, you think, oh, well, next year we'll have 0.07 more infrastructure to accommodate that beautifully smooth growth. Thing. The world doesn't work like that. I think the best we can do is yeah, maybe use this stuff as a baseline, but we have to constantly refresh it based on what we can see with our own eyes. You know, we know there's a congestion problem in Kitty Kitty. You've only got to stand on the main street for half an hour at either end of the day, um, which is not capturing some of the stuff. We know that there are going to be um, significant peaks. What happens when we make Kaikoi amazing again, you know, the work we're doing in the main street, that could attract a lot more people to Kaikoi, and I hope it does, otherwise we'll fail really, make it a much more bustling, busy, harmful Northland that it was not that many years ago. So I think we have to take, as I say, we have to take all these numbers very tentatively, and we've got to plan on something, and I guess it's all we've got, but I really like the idea that we're going to have that dashboard so we can plug in actual numbers, real numbers, not projected numbers, and then we can test them against, or rather test these forecasts against what's actually happening, which gives us a sense of the reliability of the forecasting. So I think, quite frankly, that the reliability will be very low. It's, um, I certainly wouldn't hang my head on this stuff if I was investing a whole bunch of cash, which is effectively what council has to do. So it is a dilemma, and I accept that, but as I say, I just, um, the economic forecasting, which effectively this is a branch of the agents come from metrics. It's always based on a whole bunch of assumptions that sort of feed into each other, and you can end up 100 miles away from the real world if you believe those assumptions are too real. So yeah, it's enough for me. Thank you, Councillor Clinton. Uh, member Wong. <coughs> Well, thanks, Madam Chair. Just briefly, I think what I was looking for in here it was particularly around Kitty Kitty and uh, Waikato, but Kitty Kitty area was, um, and I didn't find it touched on on here. I was particularly interested in the housing sector and the, the correlation with the ageing population and the numbers of, of persons, one or sing, single or, or couples, living in three and four bedroom homes and exist without taking out the intensification, but within the existing. Um, housing market and infrastructure as to the impact on that area should, because um, we know in the last two, two and a half to three years, we know from the retirement villages that they've been in lockdown, people haven't been dying from flu or otherwise, and so we've got this 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 false um, statistic at the moment of people living longer through the fact that they haven't been exposed to external um, viruses or diseases or whatever. So that's caused a massive um, growing list in retirement, lifestyle, villages, rest homes and hospital care. So it's held those people in their homes and should those people all go out in the world this winter and get the flu and die, um, those homes are going to be released into the market with the ability to house families and um, numbers of borders and more intensification of living and existing houses and infrastructure. And I don't find anywhere in this, and this could impact hugely in Kitty Kitty and Waipapa area, with the fact that those people could come from outside the area or the existing catchment area, we don't know. But the movements, the people movement and the traffic movements are going to be have a massive impact. 
and I don't think we can wait a couple of years for an update on anything. I think we have to, as community and, and um, villages and, and, and areas and streets, we have to actually start working on our own assumptions as to how we know things are and how people live because this external information is helpful only to a certain degree. That's just my... Roger's got a comment. Trish, I just want to clarify something. We procured them the population projection. We went out to the marketplace for it. We um, we um, considered um, the expertise in this across the country, mm -hmm. um, and um, based on um, the requirements that we put together, we awarded the contract and for metrics to do this piece of work. Um, and the point of doing this piece of work now was so that it could inform the district plan and special planning projects that are in the way. So it's a base piece of information. So we're not. This is actually a a piece of information that we use to the planning processes. So everything you heard this morning from the district plan about intensification has been based on these numbers. So, um, so the non, it's not like a side plan here. This is actually the, the core of, of our planning processes is just built on this, based on procuring the expertise from the metrics of this piece of work. So um, it's, it's not a side plan. Um, um, for me, I'm also just, just so you're aware also, as um, as usually these are done through LTP processes, so we're going to do another one ready for the next LTP because we need to do population projections for the LTP. The, proje the projections based on assumptions, and um, I encourage you to read the assumptions. The assumptions are as important as the actual numbers. So um, if you want to have a look at that, so uh, that's how it's built up, and uh, if you want to understand it more, I encourage you to have a look at the assumptions which are also published with the, um, with the projections. Thanks, Roger. I just had one um, one question, and I think that was kind of in reflection of all of these other questions, is about whether or not, given what we're using this data for, and given that you've acknowledged that this is only one piece of that jigsaw puzzle, especially when we talk about growth, growth strategy and financial strategy and infrastructure strategy and all of those other mechanisms, would there be an opportunity for elected members to sit down with the likes of you, for example, and do some kind of gap analysis? to be able to talk about, hey, what about that economic impact assessment, or just to sort of sense check and get a little bit of confidence as to where these gaps that we're identifying in this one set of data are, because it might be that they exist in other places, yep. but we just don't, haven't had that conversation. Would that be a beneficial would conversation be, to have? So it's actually going to be massively beneficial because we've got a number of other studies um, untrained as well. Um, we've got a functionality study that the easy water area does it function as good national policy statement. And we're also um, pending a development feasibility study, which is going to say what is the uptake of the market for housing type um, and given the cost of housing. So that's another study that we've also got on the way as well. So absolutely would love to take you through what we've got and, and pinpoint any gaps we might have in some of those um, key bits of information to inform this long-term planning processes. Fantastic. Thank you. We'll take that offline and figure out how we might be able to have that conversation at some point in the near future. Do you mind, Madam, if I just ask one more question? Mm -hmm. you don't ask this now, just if someone could answer it in time, because I, I might be reading this wrong. So I'm looking at Kaikoui, and it says Kaikoui has a population of 4,824. It's expected to grow by 28. Is that 28 people? Because then I look down, and it says we expect Kaikoui to have 116 new homes in the same period. There won't be 116 new homes if the population only grew by 28. So I'm obviously not reading it. Oh, I'll ask right. specifically about that. Come on. Um, so just yep. clarity on that. Good example. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, last item of the day, so I'm going to put it to the vote before we lose quorum. We've got a resolution in front of us that the Strategy and Policy Committee received the report. Far North District Population Projections moved by Councillor Tepanier, seconded by Deputy Mayor Court. All those in favour? Those against? No. Carry. Thank you. Very last item. Thank you. 6.3 Strategy and Policy Action Sheet Update, June 2022. That the Strategy and Policy Committee received the report Action Sheet Update for June 2022. I'm happy to move. Do I have a second that? Councillor Tepanier, thank you. Any comments, questions? No? I'll put it to the vote. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? No. Carry. Thank you very much for a massive day. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm feeling slightly hit by a bus, but we did some really, really good work. Um, I just want to thank those of you who were left at the committee for your patience with me today. It was a new way of running our committee, and I think 
even though it was a long way, uh, Darren and your staff included, uh, it, it gave us a more robust decision making process. Uh, so I think at 2.59 we'll close off our meeting. Before you close, Madam Chair, can I just thank you? It, our staff have worked incredibly hard pulling together the district plan. And I'm sorry I wasn't here to be the cheerleader when you passed the vote. Um, and all this bylaw and all this policy work has taken a huge amount of your time that is largely invisible to the public eye because you're doing that behind the scenes. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge how many hundreds of hours that I know you've put into this as the chair of this committee. And thank you for that. As the triennium comes to towards the end, the community is in a better place because we have amazing people like you. So thank you. And Darren for putting up with my staff continuous text. Staff without question. And conversation. So it's a but thank you. Start go without question. They know I love them and I thank them. But very seldom do elected members get acknowledged and thanked. Thank um, and I just wanted to say that publicly. So thank well, you. Thank you. Councillor Tiffany, will you close us with a kura kia, please? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And we're going to